Hi, my name's Nick, and welcome to the Watchmen comic sequel, Doomsday Clock. Normally I just tell the stories of comic books by describing what's on the page and showing the pages are most important, this is going to be a little different. While I'll assume you've read Watchmen, or at least know the story from the film, I mean why else watch a sequel story if you haven't heard the first story, I will not assume you have any deep knowledge of the DC Universe into which this story adopts the Watchmen Universe, so I'll be explaining things a bit more than usual. Doomsday Clock's not only a sequel, it's the story of the Watchmen Universe connecting to the DC Universe, and even then, this story doesn't show the DC Universe as it exists anywhere else. This DC Universe we'll be crossing over into has been manipulated and had its timeline altered by Dr. Manhattan, as will become clear eventually. But I think it'll really help clarify things if you know that going in. It's not a big plot reveal, you're supposed to figure it out from context clues that only longtime DC fans would catch. By the end, it will become the DC Universe proper as of 2018, but you'll see a different history in this book than anywhere else, and John is why. The purpose of this video is to share the story with you so you can compare it to the completely separate TV show sequel. Plenty of people are making videos about that, so I figured I'd do this instead, just so it's out there. Okay, now that's out of the way, let's dive in. The title, Doomsday Clock, refers to the metaphorical clock featured in the original Watchmen and in real life that shows a group of nuclear scientists' opinion of how close the world is to nuclear war, implying that a disaster is coming to the DC Universe as well by the end of this 12-part series. The format is identical to the original, using mostly a nine-panel grid layout, but with a modern art style. The original ended in 1986, and this story begins on October 22, 1992. Rorschach's journal has been published, investigated, and the world is finally coming to believe him, tearing itself apart in response. Someone new has assumed his mantle and costume, and in his journal he writes, November 22, 1992, or maybe it's the 23rd. Streets are littered with bodies, brains boil over by grotesque nightmares of a fictional invader. Clock started over. We had a chance. But they blew it. All of them. The undeplorables scream to hear themselves deafened in their echo chamber, blaming the other side for what they have instead of who they are. Their tolerance is a one-way street. While the totalitarians stand their ground, covering their eyes, preaching for a return to a rose-colored republic, unaware that for those not like them, the good old days weren't so good. Depends on your perspective. God turned his back, left paradise to us, like handing a five-year-old a straight razor. We slid open the world's belly. Secrets came tumbling out. An intestine full of truth and shit strangled us. Soon the bugs will be all that's left, and the cockroaches will go to war with the maggots fighting over the scraps of the moderates. Then they'll eat themselves and finally choke. Unless we bring God back down. Kicking and screaming because maybe we don't deserve it. Maybe the world should burn this time. We shattered the American dream. This is the American nightmare. The news reports show a world falling apart at the seams. A hostage situation has gripped the White House as the White President has shot the Attorney General. The European Union's economy has collapsed and Russia plans to invade. North Korea has a missile that can reach Texas and Americas are flooding across the border into Mexico by the thousands. A global manhunt continues searching for Adrian Veidt the U.S. hoping to absolve itself of responsibility for the alien event as Russia insists they were willing cohorts, the political unrest spreading around the globe. In New York, looters smashed the windows of Vite International, the last paper on Adrian's desk showing that he left town and his secret was exposed. None of the other superheroes can be located either, and Rorschach's original journal had been stolen after first being deciphered and verified. Troops approach Karnak, but it is deserted as well. The release of Rorschach's information prompted the free press to be shut down in an attempt to quell the unrest, but it was too late. The troops at Karnak find a head x-ray showing a large brain lesion we can assume was taken of Adrian. The National News Network takes over broadcasting, reporting that Russia has invaded Poland, and that if Russia does not withdraw in four hours, America will respond with nuclear force. The country is under mandatory evacuation, and in a jail cell a prisoner knocks out a fleeing guard and takes his keys. Or rather, was about to take his keys when they're picked up by the new Rorschach. He asks what the man still wants out, and he wisely refuses. The title of each chapter, like the original, is a line from a quote at the issue's end, and I'll leave it to you to decide what they refer to and in what sense. The title of this first issue is That Annihilated Place, and it's pretty obvious what that means. The nuclear missile key turns in its lock as Rorschach turns his key to enter a cell block. We learn that due to a global data exchange program from the period of peace, the Russians have enough information to utterly destroy America before they could respond, thus necessitating a faster launch protocol. A preemptive strike is the only option now. Rorschach can hear the prisoners screaming to get out, most of them, but behind the cell he's opening, silence. Rorschach asks if she is Erica Manson, the villain known as the Marionette. 
He tells her they have less than four hours before the prison is ashed and invites her to escape with him. She says that he told her he'd throw her down an elevator shaft if they ever met again. He tells her that was a different guy under the mask then. She demands that he prove it and he does so by removing a glove to show his black skin. She tells him he's out of his mind for dressing like that. She says that Rorschach finds him and he tells her that he is Rorschach. She asks if the rumor that Rorschach killed himself is true. He doesn't answer, but as payment for her services, he shows her a picture of a child, and from her reaction, we know it must be hers. He says if she helps him, he'll tell her where he is. She agrees, but under the condition that they also rescue her lover, Mime. They find Mime being beaten by a gang of inmates and being teased for his mutinous. Marionette calls out to him as the prisoners get a glimpse of Rorschach and react with fear. She says they know he's in the middle of a performance, but they have to go. She explains to Rorschach he enjoys playing the underdog as Mime makes quick and brutal work of the five men. He indicates that he needs his weapons before they leave, and though Rorschach is reluctant, Marionette says that he won't go without him and she won't go without him, so they head for the weapons locker. Mime opens his locker and it appears empty. Rorschach says they must have cleaned him out, but he appears to pick up two invisible handguns and he stows them in his waistband. Rorschach says he has big problems. Rorschach and his two new friends escape through a hole he made in the fence and make their way to a beaten up old car from before electric became the standard. Rorschach says he doesn't trust them. They ask him questions but get few answers except when Marionette asks if he can see through his mask and he responds that he can see perfectly. Rorschach was always a character most defined by his unique perspective and it appears that is still the case. They are the only car headed into the city as the mass evacuation is underway. Loudspeakers repeat the order to evacuate as they make entry through the sewers. Rorschach leads them through a series of tunnels to Night Owl's old garage. Marionette recognizes the Owl ship and asks if the rumor is true that Rorschach killed Night Owl and Silk Spectre before killing himself. Rorschach says it's false, and she then assumes he's teamed up with Night Owl. A voice from off Panner tells her he isn't. Ozymandias approaches with a small kitten resembling his genetically altered Link Bubastis, saying he hoped to get Night Owl out of retirement but failed, but that Rorschach is working for him. Rorschach corrects him, saying he is working with Ozymandias, never for him. Marionette asks what he wants with them, and Adrian replies that he only needs her. She then threatens to kill him if he doesn't reveal her son's location, and she says the world would give her a fortune for doing so. Adrian offers her $200 million for her aid but asks that she dispense with the threats. They are not a good idea, especially with Rorschach. He says the first Rorschach was an interesting man, a cruel man in some ways, but one who held fast to his principles. He was predictable and uncompromising, but this new one is different. Rorschach shuts him up by saying that he is Rorschach and there is nothing else to tell. Adrian apologizes for upsetting him and he says he's not upset. Not yet. Marionette asks about the mission, about finding God. Adrian says that's what Rorschach calls it and assumes she knows what he did. He says it took a lifetime to orchestrate and for a moment there was hope, but even the greatest empire decays, his very name is a testament to that. He had to laugh at the irony when he realized something, but he interrupts himself by clutching his head in pain. A quick news report updates us that two hours remain until the nuclear deadline and the American reporter claims the foreign press is lying about the troops advancing in Poland. The real truth is anyone guess, but it's also irrelevant. Marionette asks what's wrong with Adrian, and Rorschach replies that he's an asshole. Adrian agrees, but says that he also has cancer. He says his cancer is spreading, another reminder of his mistakes, implying that he accidentally gave himself cancer during his plot to give Dr. Manhattan supporting caste cancer, and he likens this to the unrest devouring the globe. His dream has died, and there is no chance of saving his world anymore, even though one man has the power to, Dr. Manhattan. He said he was leaving this galaxy for one less complicated, and Adrian's mission is to find him. We see Clark Kent and Lois Lane sleeping in his Metropolis apartment in the DC Universe, and Clark is dreaming. His father is telling him they've never seen anything like him. Clark remembers his senior prom, his father making him go so he has something like a normal life. He tells Clark that one day he'll reveal himself to the world, but he's afraid of their reaction when he does. Clark's parents worry about him, but Jonathan tells Martha he's never even had a paper cut, that he can't be hurt, even as we see on Clark's face how untrue that is. Driving home, they discuss that Clark will always be alone, except that he has them, but they won't be around forever. Just then, their pickup is hit by a truck and smashes into a tree. This did not happen in regular DC continuity. Clark awakens and tells Lois about his dream, the night his parents died. Lois can't remember the last time he had a nightmare, and Clark doesn't think that he's ever had one. The title quote is another line from Ozymandias, also quoted in Watchmen. 
he meets some fragment huge and stops to guess what powerful but unrecorded race once dwelt in that annihilated place. The back pages for issue 1 are newspapers that were on Adrian's desk, dated 20 days before the story begins. The headline, The Great Lie, paired with the image of the squid alien, tells the horse's whole story, but pause and read it if you like. On the second page are various clippings, a story about the failure of nuclear disarmament, a story about the death of the New Frontiersman employee who found Rorschach's journal. Apparently he was murdered for it when it was stolen, probably by Adrian. The ad for Schrodinger's watch repair, it's a Dr. Manhattan joke, uh, most likely a dead end in Adrian's search. And Byron Lewis slash Mothman's obituary, and a breakfast menu from a diner. Marionette tells a story about a costumer for hire called the Taylor's Wife, who would set a criminal up with a costume and a gimmick for the right price. As she does, we see a security camera showing a bank robbery. She said that most of them shit their pants when encountering their first hero and threw their suits in the trash. She says that thanks to Adrian, the world has changed, not as black and white anymore. Just as so the panel shifts to the black and white camera footage. The book is filled with little touches like this, so keep an eye out, or read the whole thing yourself. However well I summarize it, the real thing's always better. Adrian has given Mime and Marionette their costumes and makeup, expecting their cooperation in return. Rorschach says that he's expecting a lot, that they see the world through a warped lens. They're psychotic, sadistic, maybe masochistic, and should be closely watched, just as Rorschach is watching Adrian. Adrian says he has nothing to hide, but Rorschach replies nothing except everything, and says that Adrian is getting his hands dirty again. Adrian tells Rorschach that he sees the world as it is, and that he of all people knows you sometimes need to put your hands in the dirt. On the video, Mime imitates the scared reactions of all the tellers, and Marionette kisses the camera. Adrian says that they're all criminals now, but if they find Manhattan, they'll be the heroes again. The title of Chapter 2 is Places We Have Never Known. A bank teller presses the silent alarm. Mime catches her and smashes his head through the window, miming pointing a gun at her. Marionette picks up a picture of her child and taunts her with it. She cracks instantly and tells him the bank manager can open the safe. The manager yells that that's enough, yelling about how important their customers are. He's cut off, as well as his finger, by Marionette and her invisible slicing string. Terrified, he tells her the vault uses a hand reader. She asks which hand, and his eyes roll down to the cut one. Static electricity fills the air just before Dr. Manhattan appears, teleporting into the bank. The manager tells Marionette she picked the wrong bank, and she's in for it now. She's too busy being amazed by the floating blue man before her to respond. John points a finger at Mime, but before he can explode him, Marionette jumps in front of him, saying that John won't kill him without killing her. John hesitates, detecting the baby in her belly. Mime and Marionette are taken into custody instead of being exploded, as John usually handles criminals. Rorschach says that 37 people were killed before this point, that John has killed people for far less. Adrian says that's precisely the point. He knows John intimately, both physically and emotionally. He manipulated him into leaving Earth but now he needs to convince him to come back. Rorschach says they should have gotten Silk Spectre, and Adrian says seeing her with Dan might upset him, telling us that Dan and Laurie retired together. Marionette represents a moment in John's past that Adrian hopes to use to remind him who he was. Static fills the screen, meaning four hours are up and the nukes are in the air. With bitter irony, a man yells for everyone to look up in the sky, the words that usually precede a sighting of Superman. But this world never had a Superman, that's certainly not a bird or a plane he sees coming down on the city. Adrian says that he discovered that John's blue appearance is a result of him leaking electrons, that he's left a trail they can follow. The owl ship launches as the missile comes down. Adrian has retrofitted the owl ship for interdimensional travel, and he presses a button with Manhattan's icon on it just as the missile explodes, killing everyone in, in New York. The hull holds together just long enough for the travel to occur, and the owl ship shifts out of one reality and into another. Rorschach's face blurs into an ink blot image. Bruce Wayne is undergoing a psychiatric evaluation, and in every image he sees boats. He reveals that he has a friend waiting at the harbor and asks to dispense with the test. Lucius tells Bruce he needs to focus on the company and Lex Luthor's attempted stealing of his metagene research. Bruce says that Gotham needs Batman, and Lucius tells him Gotham doesn't want Batman because of the new Superman theory that no one trusts superheroes anymore. The bat isn't the symbol it used to be, it's become a disease, and protesters carry anti-bat signs in the streets. The public turning against vigilantes is meant to remind us of the Keen Act and draw a parallel between this world and Watchmen's past. 
Bruce says that it's temporary paranoia created by America's rival nations, and that Batman is necessary for the Gotham and the world. The owl ship looks a bit like a bat descending through the clouds above Gotham, and it crash lands in the same old abandoned amusement park that Joker took Barbara Gordon to in The Killing Joke, and several visuals have been replicated. Adrian recovers from the crash and awakens Rorschach. Rorschach defaults to wanting to kill Adrian until he's reminded they made a deal. Adrian calls Rorschach Reggie and tells him he's brought them to the world Dr. Manhattan fled to. Rorschach cuffs Mime and Marionette together to the owl ship before they wake up. Adrian tells him he just needs to make sure they stay put until he locates John. He retrieves Bubastis II from a compartment, telling Rorschach that she's more than a pet, she's the compass. As Adrian and Rorschach walk the streets of Gotham, an ad for a detective movie plays on TV starring Carver Coleman, who we won't meet for a while, but it will be relevant. He made the Nathaniel Dusk series of films, which garnered controversy and fame, and his murder is one of Hollywood's great unsolved mysteries. Adrian and Rorschach remark on the on-the-nose name of Gotham, and Adrian finds a library so they can learn more about this new world. Adrian finds out the biggest difference between this world and theirs is the sheer amount of costumed heroes and villains, including some who are entirely fictional in their world. Rorschach says maybe Manhattan created those, or he could be one of them. They need someone to help them navigate this world, and Adrian identifies the two smartest people on the planet, Lex Luthor and Bruce Wayne. They agree to seek them both out and explain the situation, Adrian choosing the smartest one. They arrange to meet back at the ship in 24 hours, and Adrian warns Rorschach not to interact with anyone but his target, to touch nothing. Rorschach breaks into Wayne Manor and immediately ignores his advice, deciding to eat some prepared pancakes left out. He notices the foil move on the floor, indicating a draft of air. He notices the clock and lights a match, testing to see if that's where the draft is coming from. It blows out, and he pulls back the clock, finding the entrance to the Batcave. Rorschach descends the stairs as Batman wraps up a case. He sees the image of his tied-up criminals under a street lamp, and the crook's words remind him of his visit to Arkham that day in the ink blot, and then he sees what he really saw instead of a boat, his parents lying dead in the street. Rorschach trips the Batcave's alarm and Batman is alerted. Lex Luthor tells his staff they're all fired. A vandalized sign declares that unauthorized personnel will go missing, and Luthor says that he will end the world before he lets Wayne win. He demands to know how Adrian got into his office. Adrian says he admires Luther's taste and his aspirations, that they are the smartest men on both of their Earths. Luther goes to summon security to throw him out, but gives Adrian until they arrive to speak. Mime and Marionette find a lockpick and prepare to find a drink. Rorschach explores the Batcave, and Adrian explains his history to Luther, what he did for, or to, his world, and what happened next. Luther gives a glib analysis of Adrian's plan and his dashed hope of a lasting peace, remarking that if he is his world's smartest man, he'd hate to meet its dumbest. Adrian takes this with good humor, saying that he once shared Luther's ambitions, and offers his help in exchange for Luther's belief. In the Batcave, Rorschach forms an image of Batman from his trophies, thinking that only a monster would keep trophies like that. It's how Kovacs caught so many criminals, the tokens and prizes they kept from their victims created a trail. He doesn't know how right he is, thinking that some can't let the past go, while looking at the gun that killed Bruce's parents. He thinks of Vite like a sailor lured in by a siren, trying to relive the past, but headed only for destruction. Adrian narrowly dodges a bullet, which then hits Luther. From the shadows, the shooter accuses Adrian of coming at him when he was confused and drunk. Seeing who it is, Adrian says one word. Impossible. The comedian says that this time, he's ready. Rorschach thinks that Adrian is chasing his greatest lie, that heroes aren't already all dead. Batman accuses Rorschach of eating his breakfast, and he admits that he did. The title quote reads, We are torn between nostalgia for the familiar and an urge for the foreign and strange. As often as not, we are homesick most for the places we have never known. The back pages for issue 2 are images from the tablet in the Gotham Library, Adrian's research. One story details the Superman theory, the accusation spurred by some heroes and villains claiming the United States has been secretly creating superheroes for decades and pretending their origins are natural or accidental, and that this explains why most of the world's metahumans are found in the United States. It has sparked protests and anti-vigilante sentiment worldwide and raised the tensions between nations. In Gotham, the police have joined the anti-bat protests, Scientists have put the doomsday clock at three minutes till midnight, and a bizarre green fire has destroyed a steel mill. 
This is an indicator that this world never had a Golden Age Green Lantern, as the green fire is a mystery to them, but it's indicative of Alan Scott's power being used. The following story is on LexCorp's industrial espionage of Wayne Enterprises, as the two are locked in metahuman research in a new arms race. The final piece is by Lois Lane, a de detailed Superman's bold stance against the metahuman outrage being fueled by Lex Luthor. We see the end of the comedian's life as Adrian throws him out his own window, his body shattering the glass. He plummets toward the street, but his vision begins to black out, and he is enveloped by darkness. The title of Chapter 3 is Not Victory Nor Defeat. His vision returns, and he now sees waves beneath him, and the comedian lands safely in a body of water. He swims to shore and is greeted by Dr. Manhattan, who has teleported him from his impending death to here and now for reasons not yet known. Ozzy Mandias and the Comedian fight as Luther bleeds out on his office floor. The Comedian punches Ozzy into a window, but only cracks. Blake laughs out loud at the look on Adrian's face, and says it's a shame it's strong glass. It wouldn't be poetic justice to throw him out the window. Adrian takes his meaning and ducks fast, cradling Bubastis too. He turns out the lights, which does not impress Eddie. He dodges a golden stiletto blade, and Adrian kicks him in the face. He says clearly John did this, and asks what he's doing here, as he continues beating Eddie. He slips in Luther's blood and misses with a chop, giving Eddie the chance he needs to backhand him away. The comedian says that people called him sick, but what he did was nothing compared to what Adrian did, and that if he killed him now, they'd give him a goddamn medal. He fires three times, hitting the window as Adrian dodges the bullet, the third grazing his head. He says that Eddie was never one for medals, and Eddie says that death changes a man, and that Adrian has nowhere to go. Adrian jumps out the window, breaking the perforated glass. He detaches his cape in mid-flip for a better aerial maneuvering, rolls down a slanted part of the building, and plants a foot on the edge. Adrian expertly flips across the street to a window washer's rig, then flips down to an awning when the rope breaks. The awning breaks and he lands on a limo. Now this does impress Eddie. In the Batcave, Batman tells Rorschach that he's trespassed into a very dangerous place. Rorschach asks if he is Bruce Wayne, and he says that he wears a mask too. He says he is not an enemy, that he is Rorschach. He attempts to explain his mission, but not very well, so he gives Batman Kovac's journal to read instead. Batman sits down to read as Rorschach waits. After a while, he asks how far Batman is, and upon learning he's only on page 4, Batman suggests he go upstairs, clean up, and get some rest. The news is covering the protesters who are demanding that Batman reveal his secret identity so they can question him about the Superman theory, the attempt to explain why 97% of the world's metahumans are American. The actor, Carver Coleman, seen as a hero by some, a deviant by others, and the old people's home is watching his movie marathon. An aged Johnny Thunder waits at the window for his grandchildren to visit, grandchildren who will never come. Because of John's changes to the timeline, there never was a Justice Society of America, and Johnny Thunder never met his magic genie, the source of his powers. Here he's just a sad old man. The Superman theory states that after Superman's arrival, which everyone believes is genuine, the American government began experimenting in secret, possibly with Superman's help, to create metahumans. Metamorpho, Manbat, and Lady Clayface have all come forward with this accusation and stories of their own experimental origins. The TV has switched to the final Nathaniel Dusk film in Carver's last role, The Adjournment, from 1954. In the film, Dusk is a broken-down detective who's lost his family and is drinking to forget them when an unexpected visitor arrives at the door on Christmas Eve when he's meant to be closed. He levels a gun as the door opens. In the darkness, he can't see his face. Back at Wayne Manor, Alfred shows Rorschach to the smallest guest room they have at his request. He compliments Alfred on the pancakes, and Al Alfred offers to make more. He leaves Reggie, telling him to make himself at home. Once alone, he unmasks, thinking of home. He showers in a bathroom worth more than the block he grew up on, feeling wrong and out of place. He compulsively scrubs his head until it bleeds, trying to clean himself of the stain of shaking hands with bite while knowing what he did. In the Dusk film, he is investigating a double murder with no witnesses or suspects. The police have asked for his help, or rather one cop Dusk still talked to after he quit the force due to hypocrisy. The channel flips to the news, showing an explosion in Germany, reported to be an attempt to create superhumans gone awry after one of Germany's few heroes was seen fleeing the scene. Marionette and Mime have found their way to a bar called Jumping Jacks, and upon entering, they are accosted and told their makeup isn't allowed, the boss doesn't like it. They ask who that is, 
and are informed that this is the Joker's turf. Marionette asks, who is the Joker? This draws more attention and disbelief. Marionette says they just want a drink, but the bouncer grabs her and threatens her with a knife. My mime's pointing a gun at him. He isn't scared, and doubles down on his threat. Mime pulls the trigger, and the man's head explodes backward in a spray of blood. Mime apparently has a pair of invisible guns after all. It's not too far outside the realm of possibility as the Watchmen world had a unique level of technology, but it's never explained how they work. He shoots two more attackers and then throws an invisible knife into the neck of a third, which excites Marionette. She readies her slicing string and begins lopping off parts, first half a man's head, then a gun, and then the hand holding the gun, finally taking the man's head off at the eyes. His bloody view melds into a plane on a red wine label. I think all these blending images are a motif meant to evoke the two worlds are blending, Watchmen and the DC Universe. Mime and Marionette enjoy their drinks in peace as they have murdered every single person in the bar. They decide to go and find this Joker. The news reports that Lex Luthor is in surgery, where his attacker, Adrian, remains in serious but stable condition. Many believe the assassination attempt is in response to Luthor's anti-metahuman rhetoric and his announcement of the metagene detectors. They are being installed at airports worldwide as the Middle East begins its own metahuman arms race. The channel flips back to the movie as the old folks fight over the remote. The victims were the cop's brother-in-law and his neighbor. Detective and the cop decide they must identify who was the target and who was the victim of circumstance. As payment for his services, Nathaniel Dust requests access to his ex-wife's apartment. Her previous ex killed her and her grandparents took the kids to live elsewhere. Dusk has come back for the last thing he has left for the love of his life, a final Christmas present, still unopened. Reggie remembers the day of the squid attack. He was driving home to meet his parents when it appeared before him. When it does, he awakens with a start. Bruce Wayne is at his bedside and comforts him. He says that while Reggie slept, he read Kovac's journal, and he knows where Dr. Manhattan is. Batman says that he ran a search for temporal anomalies and found one in Arkham Asylum. The guard at the asylum is also watching the adjournment, and Dusk has agreed to help through Christmas Day. The guard reveals the movie's big twist is that one of the victims was a killer as well. Rorschach and Batman sneak in on an inmate transfer truck. Rorschach notices they both use grappling guns, realizing perhaps they aren't so different after all. Batman leads Rorschach deep into the asylum, following a signal. Rorschach admires Batman's compact equipment, asking if he could spare any. Batman begins to agree when they arrive at a cell. Batman tells Rorschach that Dr. Manhattan is inside, and he rushes in, only to find words carved in the wall of the empty cell reading, We're all mad here. He turns to see Batman closing the door on him. Batman says that he's sorry, but Rorschach belongs in here. Rorschach screams, threats, and demands to be let out as Batman leaves. The title quote for Chapter 3 is by Teddy Roosevelt. Far better is it to dare mighty things, to win glorious triumphs, even though checkered by failure, than to rank with those poor spirits who neither enjoy nor suffer much, because they live in a gray twilight that knows not victory nor defeat. The back pages for Chapter 3 are a Hollywood tabloid featuring the murder of Carver Coleman. No date is given, but from contact, I believe it is 1954. The details given are that Carver Coleman, after celebrating the completion of the adjournment with friends, went home and was found killed the next morning, beaten to death with his own film award, in a parallel to the murder of Hollis Mason. The only thing missing was a watch he always wore, given to him by his parents the day he left home. The tabloid goes on to reveal that Coleman had a shocking secret hidden in his past, as the police were unable to locate the farm or the parents he claimed to have. They then found a secret room in Coleman's house, the walls filled with clocks and his watch collection. In a desk in that room was a letter from a woman claiming to be Carver's mother, attempting to blackmail her son for money, but she disappeared shortly after, leaving the police once again clueless. His films are described briefly, and the controversy was mostly due to using words like virgin and abortion, depicting drug use, and a director who was labeled as a communist. We also learn that Carver arrived in Hollywood in 1928 and delivered mail until his first role in 1930. The final page is mostly easter eggs, the first bullet point detailing the birth of Rita Farr, later a member of the Doom Patrol, the second deals with men who should be in the JSA but aren't, like boxer Ted Grant, and a conspiracy around the death of Sergeant Rock, a DC World War II character. The final piece clears Carver's screenwriter of his murder, he was in the drunk tank at the time. Rorschach is in Arkham Asylum, and he shows us his ability to see what he wants to see, a coping mechanism he has developed. He remembers being bullied as a child and never fighting back because he never saw himself as a fighter. A tiger-faced man offers him protection in exchange for being his property. 
spurred by a shape in the fur, he remembers he was five years old the first time he saw a mushroom cloud. It was a nuclear test televised by Leonard Brezhnev in direct response to Dr. Manhattan's entrance into the Vietnam conflict. We now learn that Reggie is in fact Reggie Long, the son of the doctor who interviewed Walter Kovacs, who lost his faith in humanity and then died in the squid attack. Reggie's mom wants to move, but Malcolm Long is convinced his career is in New York until he begins writing books. Reggie was an only child, a good boy, who avoided trouble, but had average grades and was antisocial. As Rorschach is dragged, kicking and screaming back to his cell, he spits out a large chunk of skin with fur still attached. Reggie remembers being in college and hearing the editor of the New Frontiersman asking if we shouldn't reevaluate Rorschach as a patriot and American, and about his father having his first interview with Kovacs. His father told him everyone was searching for enlightenment, for meaning, for purpose. That was before he met Walter Kovacs. Reggie's on the phone with his mom. The students are protesting the use of Manhattan in Vietnam, but all he cares about is his father. He's worried about him. He's read disturbing things about Rorschach, but his mother assures him the papers have it all wrong, that his father's making progress, and that he and Walter are becoming friends. When we see her face, we know that she's lying. Kovacs would have saved his father's career, but the world went to hell and Rorschach escaped. We're back on the street during the squid bomb, we learn that Reggie saw his parents die in the blast of energy when it hit. Back in Arkham, Reggie screams again to be let out while restrained in a chair. The doctor assigned to him enters the room, has heard that Reggie's first day has been rough. Reggie says he doesn't want to talk to the doctor. He says that Reggie has no match for fingerprints, dental records, or DNA. That all they really know is that Batman brought him in. He asks about Batman, but Reggie is busy hallucinating an alien eye in the doctor's forehead. He has bad memories of being locked up. We see him still screaming in his car as police clean up after the attack. Reggie's one of the many people who survived but with severe mental trauma from the incident. Asylums overflowed with the glut of madness Adrian unleashed. A pregnant woman cut out her own fetus, believing it was eating her. A man cut off his legs because he wanted to be like the creature. Reggie tried to gouge out his eyes to stop seeing the dead. Uncontrolled violence during the days, tortured screaming at night. Every time he shut his eyes, he saw them coming for him. He nearly broke his arm, escaping the straitjacket. The pain on top of the grief was unbearable. He had to escape it. Reggie makes it to the roof and is about to leap off the edge when he sees a man up there already on the edge and clothed in a sheet who calmly greets him. Reggie asks the man if he's jumping too. The man says no, he's not jumping. He can fly. They said he couldn't, but with long hard work he discovered the secret of flight is visualization. He sees what he wants to see, and then what he sees is what is, and with that he steps off the edge of the roof. Byron Lewis, aka Mothman, takes flight into the night sky on wings made from materials from the asylum. The title of chapter 4 is Walk on Water. Reggie is astounded into calmness and is taken back to his cell. Reggie is being given a Rorschach test. He doesn't want to look, but the alternative is more shock therapy. He sees his parents' bodies lying in the street. The doctor explains that they thought the probability of the aliens returning is very low, but they fear that those people affected may have become sleeper agents in preparation for a second attack so it's important that they understand what's going on in his mind for more than just his own sake. Reggie remembers Byron's words about visualization, and he's able to see an image he can bear to view. He says he sees a moth. Mothman flew to a diner in town wearing nothing but his wings. Byron and Reggie watch Adrian on TV speaking from a historic meeting with the President Gorbachev. He says that both the U.S. and the Soviet Union are committed to helping rebuild Afghanistan, which the Russians had invaded and occupied before the squid bomb hit. Byron tells Reggie that he used to be a superhero, the Minuteman Mothman. Back in Arkham in the present, the doctor asks Reggie who he thinks he is and why he thinks Batman put him there. He judges the doctor to be bloated and arrogant, nothing like his father. Like Kovacs before him, he has idealized and strived to live up to a fiction of his father, the way he'd like him to be, having never really known the man he actually was. As he has walked past the cells of Arkham, Reggie wonders who, if anyone, Dr. Manhattan could be. He's placed back in his cell across from another unidentified person. He hears voices in his cell, and when he shuts his eyes, he still sees brains oozing out of ears and bodies in the street. But now he can change it to what he wants to see. His parents, happy and alive. Reggie remembers Byron teaching him how to visualize past his trauma. He asks if Reggie has anything of theirs like a photograph, but Reggie has nothing as his neighborhood is quarantined. 
Byron offers to fly to New York, asking only for sheets and bed springs for the wings. Over the years, he would make a habit of this, bringing in contraband such as candy and current magazines. One night, Byron brought Reggie everything from his father's desk. Reggie reads his father's interview notes with Kovacs. Reggie and Byron are missing a puzzle piece, both literally and figuratively, as Reggie says that most of his father's notes are missed, no doubt taken by Byron to spare him the pain of a broken illusion. Reggie is assaulted by an orderly for having his father's mug, which is broken in the scuffle. Byron apologizes, blaming himself for the incident. Reggie asks him if he knows how hard it is having all that anger inside him with nowhere to go. Byron says he was never primarily a fighter, but he'd learned a lot watching the other men of men, and in Reggie he sees a fighter. Byron trains Reggie to fight, mixing the styles of all the men and men together. The next time that orderly tries to push around someone weaker than him, Reggie knocks him on his ass with one punch. The news reports that Adrian Veidt is unexpectedly absent from the public eye amid criticism for his words at Sally Jupiter's memorial, his opinion that maybe she didn't deserve a statue as she wasn't particularly smart or moral. Byron tells Reggie that all the people affected, like him, are being rounded up and questioned about Adrian, so we can assume the investigation into his scheme is well underway. Reggie attacks an orderly with a fork, and soon given another Rorschach test. When asked what he sees in the same ink blot in which the first Rorschach saw the dog's head, he replies that he sees Rorschach. It's October 11, 1992, about ten days before the end of the world. The news is finally broken and Adrian's scheme is revealed to the world. Reggie says that everything has changed now that he has someone to blame. Byron asks what if he didn't do it, but Reggie is utterly convinced of his guilt. Reggie starts a fire while Byron hits the alarm and they escape in the chaos. Byron stops to look back though, fascinated by the flames. Byron tells Reggie that the light has been calling to him. He says he can see it. Reggie asks what he sees, but gets no answer. Byron drops his coat and extends his wings one final time and the Mothman is drawn into the flames. Reggie didn't understand. Not until later. He reads a letter Byron has left for him along with a ticket Adrian had once given him to the Antarctic. He has a map, a clipping about Karnak, and supplies for the journey. Byron asks Reggie to forgive him for not coming with him, but his path lay elsewhere. He asks Reggie to remember him as they first met on the roof so he can smile at the memory. He says that Reggie has always been searching for his true north, his direction in life. He prays that Reggie finds the truth he seeks, and that what brought them together could be random chance or a great design, but the truth is relative, and all that matters is what he sees. Reggie finds Byron's final gift, a Rorschach mask. Reggie says that the first time he held the mask, it smiled at him. He takes the ship to the Antarctic and treks across the frozen wasteland. Reggie makes it to Karnak, and the scooter Rorschach didn't take back to the owl ship is still there by the entrance, buried in snow. He enters and makes his way past the monitor room. Reggie sees Adrian, picks up a scalpel, and prepares to kill him. Adrian turns and asks that he make it quick, whoever he is. It's obvious that he's not Kovacs, and he can't imagine he was a friend of his. Reggie says that he is Rorschach. Adrian offers him comfort and aid and reveals that he has discovered a brain tumor, one that he would only trust himself to operate on. Adrian knows why he's here, because of what he did, the mistake he made. Rorschach tells Adrian he killed his parents, that he inflicted untold mental suffering on millions, most who committed suicide in horrible ways, but that he has stayed, he has fought and survived, all for this, and he puts the scalpel to Adrian's throat. Adrian tells him to go ahead and do it, to make the world cheer in celebration. He wanted them to see a monster, but now he knows that he is the monster. He says that he's sorry, that he saw the light too late. Rorschach sees the regret and pain in his eyes, and he drops the scalpel to the floor. Back in Arkham, Reggie hears that voice again, but this time it's coming from the cell across the hall. Jane Doe says that she's been in his mind for a few days, and it's a busy place. She says they have to get out of there, as she won't be around much longer. Reggie asks who she is, and she answers, a friend. Reggie remembers Mothman, as he was in his prime, and his father's words about searching for enlightenment. He says that people are drawn to it, like bugs to a light. Reggie thinks that his father was a good man helping troubled people, like Kovacs, and like himself. He thinks that he pulled them out of the darkness and into the light. Adrian tells Reggie they can still save the world, but they can't do it alone as they depart Karnak. Searchlights scour Arkham, but Rorschach and the Mystery Girl have already escaped. In the Batcave, 
Batman says that he underestimated Reggie, and he puts away his doctor disguise. Alfred agrees and reminds Bruce that he told him that he wouldn't have left someone like that alone in Arkham. He knows too much, and they don't know enough. Rorschach wonders, what is the light? It's different for everyone, but everyone is looking, seeing what they want to see, no matter how small or how big they are. A mosquito flies into the bug zapper and leaves behind a smoke trail in the shape of Dr. Manhattan's icon. The title quote from Chapter 4 is from Lin Ji Yuan. The miracle is not to walk on water. The miracle is to walk on Earth. The back pages for issue 4 are a series of letters Byron wrote to his sister while in the asylum beginning in 1962 and going up to 1992. At first she does not reply as his exposure as a superhero and subsequent commitment have caused his family great shame and embarrassment. He reminisces about their childhoods, he shares his grief at the death of a friend, he writes her a letter a week for over 10 years with no reply. In 1985, she finally does reply in the wake of the worldwide tragedy. He soon after writes about meeting Reggie and finding a new purpose in life to help this young man. In the final letter, written the day of the escape, he says that he will love her forever, but he's going to join their father and mother. He says that they have finally forgiven him. He saw them, and one day he'll see her again too. The doctors tending to Adrian in the hospital are detailing his condition. He fell 20 stories and only got a fractured rib and a pulmonary contusion, otherwise he's fine. We see his cancer x-ray and are left to wonder why the doctors didn't see it. The doctors remark that since he attacked Lex Luthor in golden pajamas and a purple cape, the police aren't going to be taking him. What happens to him is way above their pay grade. These days, even if you don't have powers, wearing a costume and committing a crime makes you a federal problem. They say that guys like him are why the protesters are after Batman. They say he brings them out. They're glad they live in Metropolis, as Superman is the only thing they can believe in anymore. Adrian wakes up and realizes he is cuffed to his bed. The title of Chapter 5 is There Is No God. The cops standing guard outside rush in at the sound of Adrian's monitor flatlining. They discover that his sensors have come loose, and Adrian says that he pulled them loose so he could get the keys to his cuffs. He politely asks the policeman to take off his uniform. They attempt to draw their guns, but no shots are fired. Metahuman incidents are spiking across the world as Hawk and Dove are arrested by Russia's Rocket Red Brigade. Adrian walks one of the policemen as his hostage out of the hospital while finding out where Bubastis is. He finds his cat in an animal control van and overhears that his costume is in a nearby squad car. After a few moments, Adrian drives away from the hospital with everything he needs. At the Daily Planet, Lois accuses Perry White of using paranoia to sell papers by changing her headline on the Luther attack to use the word metahuman. Perry admits he did it for the sales and the clicks, God help him. He was wearing a cape and that's good enough. He tells Lois the world's faith in superheroes is waning, and if she wants to change that, then to get out there and prove them wrong. Lois storms off to Clark's office, asking if it's not too late to assign Jonathan Kent a different godfather. Clark tells her Perry isn't the problem and the news shows the Russian superhuman Pozar, who says he was not government-created, but born of the disaster at Chernobyl, only reforming himself years after the incident. He is Russia's most powerful and most loyal metahuman, and he announces that due to the actions of Hawk and Dove, Russia is closing its borders to all foreigners, metahuman and otherwise. Lois is sure someone is behind the Superman theory, and she thinks she knows who. In a thrift store in Gotham, Rorschach and the blonde girl he met in Arkham get new clothes, for her, while he puts on his costume, recovered from the asylum. She says her name is Saturn Girl, and that she can read minds. He says that she must know his mission, then, and asks why is she helping him. She says she likes helping people, as we see her Legion of Superheroes flight ring. She says she can help him find Dr. Manhattan, that they will need a great big light. The Russian President Vladimir Putin holds a press conference showing off his metahumans, the people's heroes claiming they can destroy any of America's manufactured metahumans. He is also announcing an alliance with Markovia, the home of Geoforce, a powerful former Justice League member and Markovia's heir apparent. In Johnny Thunder's old folks' home, the Dusk film continues. Dusk's cop ally turned away so he doesn't witness Dusk breaking and entering, and we learn that one victim was wealthy and the other poor. Johnny's room is empty as the orderlies bring his dinner, a rope made out of sheets leading out of the window and a newspaper left on the desk, open to the article about the steel mill consumed with green fire, the only clues. 
Part of him somehow senses his missing Justice Society history, and he's attempting to follow this clue. He boards a bus for Pittsburgh. Dusk enters the suspect's home and finds a suitcase filled with money. He and the policeman also find the suspect, the rich man's accountant hiding in a closet. Down at the station, they interrogate him. He had a suitcase filled with money and women's clothing, and Dusk learns that he wishes to have a sex change operation in Europe. He had asked his boss for the money and was refused, so he took it after he was killed. Dusk believes he had nothing to do with the murder, and we see why this was his most controversial film yet. To discuss this in any way in 1954 would be radical indeed. Dusk concludes that he's just a poor old man who never hurt anyone, and he's released. Adrian arrives at the Owl Ship, still in the abandoned amusement park. Batman awaits him and says he's read all about Adrian, holding up Rorschach's journal. At the bar where Mime and Marionette had their drinks, two policemen find the comedian. Hey, don't you move. I'm not here for you, so it's best you don't see me. What the hell are you talking about? I didn't kill these bastards. I'm looking for the nut job that did. So one of two things is going to happen now. One, you're going to try and arrest me or shoot me or some shit and I'm going to have to slit your throats. Or two, you don't see me. Have a nice evening, boys. At an unspecified hideout, Mime and Marionette are finishing off more of Joker's goons. The thug offers them the money, but they say it's useless to them because Nixon isn't on it. They want his boss, and Marionette demands to know where the Joker is. She wants him to answer for his thugs attacking them at his club because they wore makeup. The goon can only give them the location of a meeting happening tonight at the Bat Signal. Batman asks Adrian what he wants on his world, and Adrian says he doesn't want trouble, but that seems to be all that's on offer as the police surround the Owl Ship. Adrian's monitors show the news of the protests, the Arkham breakout, the allegations against Firestorm, Markovia closing its borders, and the Dusk film as he launches the Owl Ship. Batman says that Rorschach escaped, which doesn't surprise Adrian. Police helicopters pursue the owl ship over Gotham. On TV, Firestorm denies the accusation he was created by the government. His archenemy Killer Frost claims the theory is true and that Firestorm is one of them. A video shows Jack Ryder, both a reporter and a metahuman known as the Creeper, being violently rescued from terrorists near Kandak. The news cuts the feed, saying that reporting on Black Adam, Kandak's metahuman leader, will continue later. As the Owl Ship flies over the protest, Batman accuses Adrian of slaughtering millions to paralyze his planet in order to swoop in and save the day. He calls it Hero Syndrome, and says that Adrian's plans end now. Adrian says that Batman seems to think he's responsible for the chaos in his city, and asks if Batman realizes the protests are for him. He says that he's read and seen enough to know that this world's heroes are busy playing a game of tag while their world falls apart, and he says that Batman has put these people through hell. Lois watches her father, General Sam Lane, on the news announcing the withdrawal of all American troops from the Middle East in the wake of protests over the Superman theory. An assistant shows Lois in to see Lex Luthor. Lex applauds Sam Lane's decision, saying he wished the costumed heroes felt the same way about not being where they're not wanted. Lois disagrees, asking Lex if he has anything to do with the Superman theory. He's been the loudest voice of criticism against metahumans for years, in addition to his outright hatred of Superman. Lex denies any involvement, saying that he's against it, and he even thinks that his research into it is what led to the attempt on his life. He offers to share what he has with Lois so they can unravel the mystery together. As he tells her that he's found out the creator of the Metahumans used to be a member of the Justice League, Superman listens in from outside. Johnny Thunder has found the steel mill, but a gang of young punks has found him as well. They attack him, and he runs. Adrian tells Batman that his world is worse off than his ever was, that the heroes are too busy putting the villains into prisons with revolving doors, they've ignored the world's real problems. He uses the smoke screen of the owl ship and pulls it up and around to attack the police helicopter with its flamethrower. He says they're all caught in a vicious cycle of entertaining themselves. Batman tells him to stop, and Adrian says he's clinging to a simplistic morality based on pulp heroes as he smashes the owl ship into a building. He wonders if that's why John came here, as he headbutts Batman, knocking him off balance. Did John come to observe their futile yet colorful lives, or did he think he would blend in? Mime and Marionette find Commissioner Gordon unconscious on the roof of the GCPD. 
Adrian says that he weaned his world off gasoline and oil. He cured famine and disease. He negotiated nuclear disarmament. We saw how well that worked out. The news shows Black Adam, who rescued Jack Ryder in neighboring Syria in violation of international law. He announces that Kandak will be a refuge for any and all metahumans who seek asylum to avoid service to their governments. Adrian has flipped the Owlship upside down as he tells Batman that he did the same thing to his world. He did whatever he had to do to save it, and though he did fail, he asks Batman what has he ever done to make the world a better place. Adrian opens the roof of the Owlship, dropping Batman onto the protesters below. Johnny runs from the gang and finds a glowing green lantern. Batman uses his grapple gun and begins to swing over the crowd. Johnny is elated that he's found the lantern. Hands clutch at Batman's cape, and the bat signal is pushed off the roof of the Jeep CPD. The punks catch up to Johnny. Batman falls under a hail of fists, and the bat signal crashes into the ground. Johnny is hit with the lantern, and the punk raises it high above his head like the statue of Hollis Mason, preparing to kill Johnny Thunder. The punk's forearm is broken by a piece of rebar and he drops the lantern. Rorschach attacks the rest of the punks. They scream in agony. Saturn Girl turns Johnny away from the violence, saying they were all destined to die of overdoses tonight anyway. On the roof of the GCPD, Mime and Marionette are addressed by... The Joker, who says they've caused him a bit of trouble tonight. His henchmen get his attention as Rorschach asks Saturn Girl to explain what the lantern is and show him a beaten and unconscious Batman. The title quote is from Eugene O'Neill. When men make gods, there is no god. The back pages for issue 5 are from a magazine reporting on the metahuman crisis found at the old folks' home. The Superman theory is detailed, how people are tested for the latent metagene in humanity and stress tested to activate their powers, then assigned a scripted hero or a villain role, guided into conflicts with others as a way of training in plain sight. The president denies all accusations, yet several metahumans have stepped forward and claimed involvement. A metahuman arms race has engulfed the world, and the heroes of several other nations are featured here. Other countries are attempting to follow the theory's method and having some success, whether it's true or not. The final article is on Kandak and its leader, Black Adam. Once a villain with his origins in ancient Kandak who opposed Shazam, he has since become a world leader when he liberated his home country from a dictator and assumed the station. He now stands only for his people and for metahumans who wish only peace. The back cover is an ad from the tourism agency of Metropolis and it looks a lot like an ad for Astro City. If you've never heard of Astro City, you're missing out and you should look it up. Joker speaks to Mime and Marionette about being forced to live a life controlled by the powerful and established, while we see a young Erica Manson hiding in her father's puppet shop as he is hassled by collectors for the mob who use his shop as a drop-off point. Joker says that pulling against the powerful is always terrifying, but so is life as a puppet. Erica's father had help coming to America, and the men say that their boss owns him. Joker says they will always try to control you unless you cut your strings and then cut the throats of everyone who ever held them. As he always does, Erica's father gives in. Joker says that costume characters wear themselves on their sleeves. Joker says he can't have people going around killing his men, only deciding not to kill the offenders because of his good mood. Marionette sarcastically apologizes, and Joker does not accept. He wonders if Harley sent them to kill him, as his birthday is coming up. The title of Chapter 6 is Truly Laugh. Joker encounters some of Mr. Freeze's lost henchmen, also headed to the big meeting. They think Freeze may have been captured, and Joker offers them the chance to join his gang instead. Young Erica plays with the doll version of her costumed self when her father says she could use a friend. The glass store across the street opens up, and she sees the family who owns it has a small boy. She sets up a puppet show for him, and he comes over to meet her, but he is mute as he stares in wonder at the dolls. Excited to have a friend, she shows him around. Joker is applying tattoos to his new henchman, and he finally accepts Marionette's apology. However, when he attempts to tattoo her, she slices a henchman's shotgun in half and mime gouges out another's eyes. Joker makes a lame head joke as Marionette decapitates the man. Joker shoots the henchman mime is attacking before he can kill him, and the matter is put to rest. They all continue on down the sewer tunnel. 
Young Erica is happily playing in the street when a gang of bullies attacks her. They say awful things about her and her father and knock her down. She is rescued by the boy from the glass shop who smashes glass bottles on them. One runs and Erica tackles him, demanding he apologize. He does, now terrified, as Erica asks the boy if he has any more glass. Joker shows them into the big villain meeting, convened in response to the Superman theory with the aim of sharing information and possibly coordinating action. There's a loose society of supervillains, this is not the first meeting of this kind. Riddler proposes it's not safe to operate alone anymore, and the villains report that several heroes and villains are retreating, those that can. Several want to seek asylum in Kandak, and Mirror Master offers safe travel for a price. Typhoon is accused of being complicit, and he denies it. All are interrupted by Joker's entrance, however, as he wheels in Batman, chained to a wheelchair. He introduces Marionette and Mime, and we see a young Erica and Marcos playing in the shop when two policemen enter. They tell Marcos that his mother had a fall, and he runs home worried. Erica's father gives the police a leprechaun doll, because they are the mob's collectors. Erica looks on in disgust in the past and the present. Two-Face asks who's in the Batsuit this time. Harvey says it's far from the first time Joker's brought them someone in a bat suit, and Scarecrow suggests another Arkham guard. Riddler tries to regain order, and Penguin makes a move on Typhoon, who blasts him away. He's in the middle of a threat when his head explodes forwards from a bullet. The comedian sits high up in the shadows with a high-powered rifle. He begins taking out the villains with headshots as Marionette runs. Mime dances out in the open, taunting the comedian. Eddie draws a bead on mine, but Titania's giant leg blocks his view. She smashes the ledge he's on. He lands, draws a pistol, and breaks Mr. Freeze's helmet. Marionette drags Mime away from the battle as Eddie shoots Riddler in the kneecap. They run just in time to escape the blast from the comedian's grenade. Joker is thrilled with this outcome. Marionette yells at Mime, telling him to stop slowing down and not draw his fire again. That's the goddamn comedian. It sure as shit is. Erica asks Mime why they're stopping. She remembers a Mime doll her father made for her to give to her mute friend. Her father makes her hide as the policemen return. He asks not to do this in front of his daughter, but they insist, knocking him down. They find Erica and drag her out, and when she is threatened, her father gives in, telling him the money is in the hero doll, Night Owl. They leave, reminding him they'll be back next week. Erica finds the shop dark. Her father has hung himself and left her a note. He tells her that he is sorry. He tells her she is safer with him gone, that the men will stop coming now. He tells her to take the money and run, to live a good life. He hopes she can forgive him. When the police arrive again, Erica ambushes them, stabbing one in the neck with a pair of scissors. Her father says that one day she will make her own family and hopes that she'll then understand the lengths a person will go to to protect their family. Marcos jumps out from the shadows, biting the other cop's hand. He knocks Marcos to the ground, but before he can hurt him, Erica garrots him with puppet wire. Her father says that he only wishes he had more to give her than his life. He tells her to go with his love, to be who she wants to be. She obviously does. Marionette says to Mime, do you want to go back out there, while I hide in here, to lure the comedian away? No. You are not going to leave me. You are not going to die so I can run. We are in this together. Do you understand me? You're the only thing that makes me smile in this dark place. The only one I want. The rest of the world can go to hell, but I can't lose you. Mime and Marionette love each other while they can, each remembering the birth of their child while they were in prison. Marionette says she wants to find their baby. They are found by the comedian who says they don't cover their tracks well. He says he only needs one of them breathing to find Ozymandias, and he points his gun at them, but he's electrocuted from behind. The Joker enters, having used his joy buzzer. He says he likes them, they make him laugh. Joker takes the comedian's happy paste button for his lone lapel, as Marionette says the comedian might know where Dr. Manhattan is, which is her key to finding her child. Joker says he could use a good dentist, it hurts when he smiles. The title quote is from Charlie Chaplin.
To truly laugh, you must be able to take your pain and play with it. The back pages for issue 6 are from the Department of Metahuman Affairs file for Agent David Drake, also known as Typhoon. Agent Drake was a discharged naval officer and marine engineer who was found to have the metahuman gene as a child. When his life hit the skids, the department approached him. He was triggered in a nuclear bathysphere accident, a controlled event by the department, gained the ability to create storms around himself and mimic flight, and assigned the role of a supervillain. He fought with Firestorm, using those confrontations to infiltrate the villain underworld. He also made contact with his estranged family, until the department punished him by blaming a regular typhoon and its deaths on him in the media, which caused him to break off contact. He was sent to infiltrate Kandak when the comedian killed him. His partner asked that he be publicly cleared of the hurricane damage and recognized as the hero he was. Her request is denied. The department must keep what secrets it can. The Superman theory appears to be true in this case, but remember that he died denying it. Does this mean the villains who claim to be its result are lying? The larger picture remains unclear. Dr. Manhattan describes points in time. In July 1940, engineer Alan Scott is on a train when the bridge collapses. He only survives by holding on to a mysterious green lantern. November 1940, Alan is sitting at a round table of other costumed men, and in 1950 he is telling the House Un-American Activities Committee that no one he knows is a communist. It's July 1940 again. Alan is back on the train on the bridge, but this time, John moves the lantern six inches out of his reach. Alan Scott dies, leaving no family. In the year 960, a green meteor falls in China. A mystic finds it, and it makes a prophecy. Three times it will flame green, first to bring death, then to bring life, and finally to bring power. The mystic shapes it into a lamp, but the scared villagers kill him with it, and are soon stricken with plague. In April of 1940, the lamp is given to a prisoner who reshapes it into a lantern. In May, he sells the lantern upon his release. In June, the lantern finds its way onto a train. In July, the lantern is recovered from the train wreck that killed Alan Scott. In 1950, John stands on Alan's grave. In November 1940, John stands and draws a circle in the dust on an empty round table. Last December, the lantern was discarded into a scrap heap. Two hours ago, Johnny Thunder finds it in a burned-out factory. 145 minutes from now, the lantern erupts with power. 17 minutes later, John steps off a checkerboard floor onto the surface of Mars. One month into his future, he sees nothing. In 1985, he leaves his world for this one. Saturn Girl tells Rorschach the lantern will help them find Manhattan. Adrian arrives to pick them up in the owl ship. Saturn Girl tells Johnny everything's going to be fine, and she's from the 30th century. Rorschach tells Adrian she didn't mention that last part when they met. He asks where he found her, and Rorschach answers Arkham Asylum. He says of course he did. The title of Chapter 7 is Blind Spot. The news shows Superman rescuing a group of school children taken hostage in Benghazi. He remains the last superhero free to cross borders without fear of retribution because of selfless acts like this. Saturn Girl says that Superman is why she's a member of the Legion of Superheroes, and that she's here to cleanse the time stream of an unknown anomaly that threatens him. That, of course, is Dr. Manhattan. Adrian is again racked with pain from his cancer, saying that maybe their work is futile, but Rorschach tells him to have hope that his father believed in the best outcome until the end, that he was going to save Kovacs from himself. Bubastis meows. She also begins glowing blue from her eyes and mouth. Adrian says they're getting close, that Bubastis was cloned from the original who had been disintegrated with John, and she reacts to his energy signature. Adrian asks Rorschach to look at his journey so far. The first Batman leads him to Arkham, where he finds a hero from the future. Then she finds him a hero from the past. He claims it's coincidence. And Adrian says when it comes to Dr. Manhattan, there are no coincidences. Eddie wakes up to find himself tied to a chair at the mercy of three psychopaths. The Joker tells him he's impressed with Eddie shooting Riddler. What's green, red, and missing a kneecap? He laughs. 
Marionette selects a power drill to begin the interrogation, and she and Mime kiss. Joker is disgusted at their sincerity. Eddie asks how the hell White roped him into this, and why. Marionette says she's going to ask the questions, telling Eddie he died in the past, yet here he is and hasn't aged a day. She asks if it's because of John. She drills into his forearm, saying if he tells them where he is, she'll only drill into his arms. This is the easy part. Eddie says who the hell knows where or when that asshole is. He was only supposed to take out Vite's cat, that's all he knows. He was just having fun with the villains meeting, doing what he does. Mime gets Marionette's attention, giving her a signal that can only mean Batman. Batman throws a smoke bomb and narrowly ducks Marionette's slicing string, easily kicking her in the stomach during a flip. Mime fires, but only hits Batman's cape. Bubastis' eyes glow brighter, guiding Adrian to a factory. He lands, asking Johnny Thunder and Saturn Girl to stay there, and asking for the lantern. He says it'll be dangerous inside, but that Johnny will find his thunderbolt again. It's history. Batman punches Mime, but Marionette gets her string around him, and he only blocks it with his gauntlets, but it slices into his arm. He headbutts her off and dodges Joker's flamethrower. Rorschach arrives and says it's no time for laughing. Batman tells Rorschach he was wrong about him. Adrian says he was wrong about a lot of things, maybe everything. He supposes that comes with being a cornerstone of his world's growing problem. Marionette points out to Adrian that she's been on the case by finding the comedian. Eddie asks, what's so special about that cat, and what's wrong with it, as she glows brighter still. Adrian says she's working perfectly. He says that Bubasta sees John's temporal fingerprints on the lantern and on Eddie, as she feeds John to feel a strong pull to her like a magnet, and to deny it would prove painful. Bubastis is absorbing the cast-off electrons John always leaves in his wake, and through quantum entanglement he is drawn to her as well. Adrian screams for John to appear, threatening him with more pain. The air cracks open, blue light shining through. Dr. Manhattan appears, and Adrian says hello. Batman says he knows who he is. Joker asks him to put on some clothes. Rorschach asks what he's doing as John draws a circle on the floor around everyone from his universe. Adrian apologizes for summoning him like that, but he needs to talk. The circle and everything inside it vanishes in a flash of blue light. John says, So let's talk. I had no choice, you understand. You know our world is in trouble. I've come to ask for your help. I failed to save it from itself. Now you're the only one who can. You've come a long way for nothing, Adrian. I'm not going back. I'm in the middle of something. You're thinking I've once again turned my back on humanity. That's why you asked Laurie to come with you, to remind me. She refused, but she led you to them. Erica Manson and Marcos Mayas. I'm at Rockefeller with Laurie, listening to her complain about the security cameras installed in our living quarters. As I remove them, I'm told there's a bank robbery in progress one mile away. I arrive to dispatch the criminals. You believe I'm hesitant to use extreme force when I learn Erica Manson is pregnant. But I did not spare you because you were pregnant, Erica Manson. I saw what your child would do, and I chose to save him. What are you talking about? What did my child do? Which child? What do you mean, which child? Ah, yes. Sometimes I forget what's been and what will be. You're pregnant again. What? John, your pleading will not change my mind, Adrian. I'm disappointed in you. I was. I am. I will be. Manhattan. Hey, is someone gonna untie me? John! Need to listen. Why didn't the same man you knew? I was going to kill him myself for what he did, but found him changed, dying from cancer. Cancer? Adrian does not have cancer. No. Look again. He's sick. Let me talk to John Rorschach. He's only confusing you. No, I... You have cancer. Rorschach, now hold on. You have cancer! As we hover here, you tell him the truth, Adrian. Because you know I will. I don't have cancer. I never did. Why? Why would you lie? Because I needed your help. Don't understand. Oh, Reggie. You see what you want to see. 
and what you wanted to see, what you needed to, was that the man responsible for the death of your parents and the madness that afflicted you was overcome with regret and remorse. I knew everything about you before you stepped a foot in that room, and I needed someone like you, Reggie. Stop calling me Reggie. I am Rorschach. Rorschach? Please. You saw what you wanted to see with Rorschach, too. You believed you were taking up the mask of a friend of your father's. But Walter Kovacs was never your father's friend. If Byron Lewis hadn't kept most of your father's notes from you, you would have seen that. Byron was trying to protect you from the truth. That Rorschach broke down your father's undying positivity and left him a shell of the man he was. His relationship with your mother deteriorated into nothingness. She left him, Reggie. Your mother and father did not die in a loving embrace. They died despising one another. Alone. No. No. Is it true? Is it? It is. Why are you here, John? At first, I thought I might find a place among them. But something happened. As I looked forward, I saw the vision of the most hopeful among them heading toward me now hopeless, and then I saw nothing. Two men are playing a game of chess. Both were shot and killed before the game was finished. What are you saying, John? That your visions end? Who did you see? Why bring us here? Where the hell is here? The Revival Theater in Hollywood, playing a midnight showing of Carver Coleman's last film, The Adjournment. It's April 1954. I stand on the set and watch. It's June. I see Carver Coleman's body on the floor, his head caved in. Carver Coleman was once full of hope, too. But I was wrong, Adrian. Everything ends. What's this have to do with anything, John? We've talked enough. Goodbye. John, wait. Adrian says they need to call him back to make him listen. Rorschach kicks him and screams, Listen to me! Why couldn't you leave me alone? Mime and Marionette sneak off with the lantern as Rorschach beats Adrian. He says Rorschach doesn't even realize yet that he's still wearing the mask of the man who destroyed his father. Joker says that whatever they missed must have been a doozy. He uses his joy buzzer on Batman as Rorschach continues beating Adrian, intending to kill him. Joker tries to interfere and Rorschach switches to beating him instead in his rage. Joker just smiles at him and he's dropped. Reggie says that Rorschach is dead. Adrian makes it back to the owl ship, badly bleeding. He tells Saturn Girl that he learned a few things the hard way. She reads his mind and sees that what he's planning isn't supposed to happen. He knocks both her and Johnny Thunder out, dumping them on the street and taking off with only Bubastis, intent on using his knowledge to save both worlds. God help us all. Adrian has a plan. Reggie drops his mask. Black Adam has entered Jerusalem. Joker drags his broken body across the floor. Someone mails a package to Lois Lane. Batman finds the mask. Reggie tries to lose himself. John arrives on Mars. Dusk says two men were playing chess and none came out alive. John thinks, I step off a checkerboard floor onto the surface of Mars. I'm overcome with curiosity for the first time since 1959. One month in my future I see Superman. He's yelling at me though I'm deafened by the thunder from the world falling apart around us. His eyes burn with anger as he throws his fist forward. Then, I see nothing. A year, a century, a millennium. Still nothing. I do not see tomorrow. And I wonder, one month from now, does Superman destroy me, or do I destroy everything? John leaves a photograph behind him, which he is unaware of. The title quote is from R. Buckminster Fuller. Seeing is believing is a blind spot in man's vision. The back pages for issue 7 are Adrian's notes on cloning Bubastis too. He had blamed her death on the psychic backlash, but also started a major wildlife conservation effort in her name. By August of 1986, he is attempting to clone her from the DNA and somatic cells left in her ashes, with limited success. In October, his animated series premieres, and it reminds him of how much he misses her, and he returns to the attempt. By March of 1992, Adrian has realized he has to use John's DNA merged with Bubastis's 
due to the intrinsic field process they underwent. A small cat-like nervous system has been seen wandering the halls, and then a circulatory system was caught in the loading docks, and then a feline skeleton. By the end of the month, Bubastis II had appeared. By November, Adrian has outfitted the owl ship for interdimensional travel and found a way to use Bubastis to track John. Not only can her energy be used to track and draw John, she also obscures his vision around her. She is a living blind spot. Adrian is more determined than ever to save the world, whatever the cost. Still obsessed with using his own intellect and John's godlike power to save humanity, now from his own mistakes, Adrian is perhaps at his most monstrous when and because he truly is motivated by love. It's what he does with it that then makes it perverse. Adrian finds a file in the Oval Office while Bubastis naps on the rug. The title of Chapter 8 is Save Humanity. At the Daily Planet, Clark and Lois are shocked by the news from Russia of forced metagene testing of every child born, and the protests that stories of babies taken into custody have sparked across the country. Seconds ago, Firestorm illegally entered Russian airspace and attacked the people's heroes. Clark tells Lois that Ronnie Raymond is not part of the Superman theory, despite what she's heard. He's worried about Ronnie's temper, as he's really just a kid. Perry White asks who wants to go to Moscow, and two hands shoot up. Firestorm attacks Pozar, accusing him of trying to destroy his life. The other Russian heroes try to keep the fight away from the crowd. Ronnie lashes out, and they lash back, a wraith-like hero passing through him. Ronnie falls to the ground and is swallowed by the angry crowd. He's panicked and unleashes a burst of power. Normally, his power to transmute matter only affects inorganic materials. Normally. Yet somehow Firestorm has turned the entire crowd of people into glass. He is horrified and confused and flies away. Jimmy Olsen timidly asks if Firestorm just killed all those people, afraid to believe what he's seen, what the whole world has just seen. Lois says it can't be what it looks like, but Clark is already gone. The White House is already denying any connection to the Department of Metahumans as Superman rockets through the sky. Lois's mystery package waits on a mail cart. Superman arrives in Kandak, a welcome guest. Titania leads him to Black Adam. Black Adam sits in his throne room and welcomes Superman to Kandak. They shake hands. Black Adam shows Superman his people living in peace. He says they have no secrets and no one to hide. Superman meets a young boy who developed the power over the sands and used it to free thousands of children from slavery and brought them to Kandak where all are welcome, even Firestorm. Superman insists he only wants to talk to understand what happened. Black Adam tells Superman he can't trust the media, the Russians, or the Americans. Superman tells him the Superman theory is a lie. Adam says that it is truth that he has individuals there who were part of it. He says that things must change. The people with the power to change things must act, though Superman may not be among them. Black Adam calls him a glorified firefighter in a cape. Superman warns Adam not to violate international law and leaves peacefully. Adam tells him to tell Firestorm he is welcome to asylum there if he wishes it. Superman searches the planet for Ronnie, and Lois suggests maybe he never left Russia. Lois finally opens her mail and finds a flash drive with no return address. On it, she finds video evidence of a justice society that never existed in the form of a World War II film strip. Superman finds Ronnie in a disused nuclear reactor, trying desperately to return a glass child to human form. He can only change things if he knows their atomic structure, and the professor's mind, joined with his, provides the information, but they are at a loss. Superman says he's not there to fight, and asks Ronnie what happened. He says that his power is never used to affect anything organic. He doesn't know what happened. The professor says it's impossible to help the child, but Superman believes in him. He says that Ronnie did it once, and he can do it again. Ronnie says he'll try, but Superman should leave him alone. If he keeps pushing himself, he might detonate. Superman says he's not leaving him, and he'll be fine. Ronnie focuses the power and pushes it to the limit, putting everything he has into the effort. Miraculously, it works. The child is restored to life. He runs to Superman, instantly trusting him. Superman says he's really alright, and now everyone else will be too. Ronnie and the professor both say thank you. In Russia, President Vladimir Putin states a message to America and the world. He says that they are at a violent crossroads that will shape the future. Major global conflicts have been avoided for decades due to geostrategic power balance which used to exist. He says that the anti-nuclear agreement used to be the linchpin of international security, 
but on behalf of his hundreds of murdered Russian citizens, he can no longer tolerate America's lies. They have been amassing an army covertly for over a decade, he claims, forcing them to amass their own. He vows that Firestorm will be found, as well as those who created him. He says they are at war. Suddenly, up in the sky, Superman flies down and says he was hoping to convince Putin otherwise. Putin assumes that Superman is here to help, and he says that he is. Pozar demands that he turn over Firestorm, but Putin tells him that Superman does not speak for America, but for the entire world. Superman says, Thank you. I'd like to explain to you, to everyone, there's still hope. In times like these, it's hard to remember that. What happened here is a tragedy that affects every one of us. I'm not here to pass judgments. That's not my role in the world. But I am here to ask you to trust me. What Firestorm did was an accident, but it's one that can be undone. You all know I come from another planet, one that was called Krypton. My world did not survive because a council couldn't agree. They couldn't come together to try to save it. We need to come together now. We can't let those trying to divide us divide us even further. The Superman theory has spread fear and hatred throughout the world. It is the source of the riots in our respective countries and the strife between our nations. What the hell are you doing? And the tragedy here in Moscow. Clark, it's Bruce. You need to stop talking. The keep your mouth shut. Don't pick a side. The demonization of metahumans is wrong. The demonization of any group of people is wrong. Superman says that Firestorm is not a villain, that he can change the people back. But the message is lost as Putin cuts him off, saying that Firestorm killed those people, and for Superman to suggest otherwise in the presence of those he killed. And then he cut off, as a woman in the crowd screams that Firestorm murdered her child. And then Firestorm appears in the sky. Putin asks Superman what trickery this is, and Superman says that it's not. The Russian soldiers fire on Firestorm and the restored child before he can explain. The child runs and Superman dives to block the bullets. A stray bullet hits one of the glass people, and Firestorm destroys the man's gun in response. The people's heroes decide that to end this, they must capture Firestorm, even if it means fighting Superman. Podar grabs Firestorm, calling him a liar when he claims that he can save them. The tanks begin to move and one crushes another glass person. Superman throws off all the people's heroes as he shouts, No! Superman knocks the tank over, but he appears to be attacking the Russian forces on TV. Lois is shocked. Batman is just pissed. Ronnie struggles to change this one person back to show that he can save them, but he can't do anything with the broken pieces. He falls to his knees, glowing brighter and brighter. He screams. The news reports that Superman has sided with Firestorm as the Batwing nears Moscow. Batman warns Superman with his high-frequency radio the energy readings are spiking. Superman asks Ronnie not to lose control, but he seems okay. Batman yells, It's not Firestorm! A burst of blue energy explodes Red Square, destroying all the cameras and damaging the Batwing. Standing before a bank of monitors, Adrian says, Yes. It begins. The title quote for issue 8 is from H.L. Mencken. The urge to save humanity is almost always a false front for the urge to rule. The back pages from issue 8 from the final newspaper edition of the day covering the biggest story in the world. The next day's paper provide more in-depth coverage as the pieces are put together. Two days later, Superman is still missing. Hundreds are dead from the blast. Firestorm has been blamed. Though the planet found the boy Superman was saving on the footage, the world races even faster to the brink of metahuman war. Dr. Manhattan is illustrating the changes the timeline undergoes because of his change. He holds a Legion of Superheroes flight ring from the 30th century left from when a hero died to save Earth's sun. The explosion sent the ring back in time to now like a tachyon particle. Back in 1940, he moves Alan Scott's lantern out of its reach, and in his hand, now there is no ring. There never was. He looks forward in time, but he cannot see anything after a week. It is nothing but darkness. He can't see beyond that point when he sees Superman's fist coming towards him with blood on it. So he has one question he is unable to answer. In a week's time, will Superman destroy him, or will he destroy everything? A mass of ships leave Earth headed for Mars. The title of Chapter 9 is Crisis. 
Aboard the ships are an assemblage of Earth's heroes. The Hawk People, the New Gods, the Green Lanterns, the Justice League. Steel, Supergirl, and the Metal Men. The Justice League Dark, the Doom Patrol. Batman and the Outsiders, Shazam and the Marvels, and the Charlton characters who the Watchmen cast were based on are all headed to Mars to confront a very powerful threat to the world, Dr. Manhattan. Five days ago, a detonation on Earth created a tachyon fog, obscuring the immediate past and future from John's view. It's like trying to read through a kaleidoscope. Now they begin to fade, and he can look into the immediate past, following them to their source, the Moscow disaster. We see the Justice League recovering Batman and Superman from the blast area. There is no sign of Firestorm. While Superman lies unconscious in a hospital bed, the march against metahumans masses outside the Justice League headquarters. Allegations fly of fraud, collusion, accessory to murder. The world's trust in Superman has been shaken, if not broken. Lois couldn't care less. She only wants him to wake up. Even the United States isn't standing up for him, the President tweeting his lack of support, but choosing not to release Firestorm's Department of Metahumans file. Reggie sits on the streets of Gotham with a sign reading, You see what you want to see. The news reports the metahuman exodus as they leave from Washington. Wonder Woman will address the United Nations soon. Bruce Wayne awakens and Alfred tells him Superman is recovering in the Hall of Justice. He asks about Firestorm. Firestorm, in his separate body as a Ronnie Raymond and Professor Stein, is on a ship headed to Mars. Stein tells him they were framed for the disaster. Ronnie says it's like the lie that he's part of the Superman theory. Batman can't believe the heroes have all left the planet. Green Arrow heaps scorn on the media, criticizing Superman. Alfred says the heroes analyzed the scene and found Firestorm wasn't the source, but they traced the energy to Mars. Bruce thinks there's more going on than that, and prepares to send a message to Mars. It'll take 13 minutes. The Green Lanterns arrive and find a photograph John left in his wake, but they still know nothing about him. But they've also found a structure up ahead. Lex finds Lois, asking if she's got the drive he sent her. She prepares to defend Superman, but Lex says that he's here to help. Stein wants them to turn themselves in, but Red Tornado says they're about to confront the villain responsible, and they become Firestorm. The Lanterns create a bubble around Mars, and Ronnie fills it with breathable air. The question claims the Superman theory is fact, not conspiracy, but no one wants to hear it now. John's sight is still clouded, so his immediate future is unclear, but he sees how this ends. Martian Manhunter introduces himself and asks John who he is, where he's from, and what his intentions are. He says they're here looking for answers they don't know the questions to. Guy Gardner assumes he is insane because of his time confusion. He postures, telling John about all the threats the heroes of Earth have defeated. Manhunter says he's confused. John says it's only for the moment, as in five seconds Martian Manhunter will broadcast the clearest thought he's found in John's mind, his final vision of Superman. He does, and the heroes assume John intends to destroy Superman before he can destroy him, or possibly end the universe. Gardner attacks, punching John in the face. His neck snaps, and he falls to the ground, and his body disappears. John instantly reforms himself. He's curious about Gardner's ring, and asks what's inside it as he touches it. The ring vanishes, and Guy's in his regular clothes. He admits it's enjoyable not knowing what was and will be and he analyzes the energy as emotion coalesced and manufactured into power by the ring, and he finds it difficult to affect. Not surprising, as one thing John lacks is willpower. The magic users attack next, and John says they all believe they're using magic. He easily controls everything they send at him, saying it's the power they harness is actually the scraps of creation, like random errors in computer code discarded and forgotten, left to be picked up and used by those who also find themselves discarded and forgotten. An accurate description of DC's magic. He says it feels good to still learn, and unleashes the power, blasting the heroes back. Lex tells Lois he's here to help her with the story of her life. Saying he understands her caution, he hands her a loaded gun. He sent her the footage of the heroes who never were, saying it's proof that there's a force out there undermining all of creation. He asks if she's ever heard of Wally West. Wally's been missing since the New 52, at this point lost in the Speed Force and erased from history. Wonder Woman prepares to unveil her plan for peace to the United Nations, and on Mars, Firestorm attacks Dr. Manhattan, saying he doesn't know who they're dealing with. John agrees that he is not. Ronnie sits in a hall in regular clothes, and John tells him that they are seven years ago, two hours before he becomes Firestorm. People outside are protesting a power they fear. 
John says that Firestorm is one of the most powerful metahumans he's ever encountered, and potentially the most deadly. Ronnie hears Professor Stein's voice saying it's almost time. Stein is on the phone to his Department of Metahumans boss describing the study he's put into Ronnie and the proposed accident about to occur. He plans to learn more about the metahuman community from the inside. Ronnie insists that it's all a lie and tells John to get out of his head as flames burst from his head and hands. It was only a mental projection. John says he simply wanted to prove that even hope decays. Firestorm unleashes energy at him, causing him to kneel. The other heroes see this as vulnerability and pile on with their own energy attacks. John finds it all interesting. The Green Lantern, Supergirl, Shazam, and others fire energy blasts at him until Captain Adam says, forget Superman, he's the last thing John is going to see, and he splits his body apart with nuclear force. A similar detonation occurs on Mars, scattering rocks and debris. Wonder Woman stands before the United Nations and says today is the day we can begin to heal. She says the world has been under assault by mistruths, fear, and extremism, that there is no singular villain behind it. They've all played a role. Batman's message fails to send, and the heroes are picking themselves up. John reforms again, nervous system first, and asks what it is they were hoping to accomplish. John puts all the heroes to sleep without further harm as Diana is interrupted. Titania and Black Adam crash through the roof of the United Nations. He's heard all her friends are on vacation, and he's making his move. The title quote for Chapter 9 is from Seneca. Wherever there is a human being, there is an opportunity for crisis. The back pages for Issue 9 are Firestorm's Department of Metahumans file. A letter written by Martin Stein confirms that what John showed Ronnie was the truth. Ronnie was never aware of it, but his creation was coordinated. Stein's theory was correct that the more powerful the accident, the more powerful the metahuman created. Nathaniel Dusk lies on the floor with the answer to his mystery. His ex-wife isn't dead after all. It was all a setup to get Dusk to kill her current husband by making him believe he had killed her. At the end of the scene, Carver Coleman asks for his next line. It's June 8, 1954, and John is attending the final shooting day of the adjournment. Carver hasn't finished one take. He says it's a headache, but, he, but really he received a blackmail letter a week ago threatening to expose his darkest secret. The next day, Carver lies on the floor in a pool of blood, his head caved in. Five days later, John stands at Carver's grave and feels nothing. The title of Chapter 10 is Action. Back on the set, Carver insists they have to finish shooting today. At 10 that night, he awaits his blackmailer. His mother approaches and says she only wants to protect his lie, but it's going to cost him. He says he doesn't want to do this here. Four hours ago, Nathaniel Dust asks his ex-wife if she ever loved him, or if it was all a game to her. She says that she did, and that's why she left him that present. Murray, his cop friend, also in on the scheme, insists that he open it. Inside is a glass globe, and his ex says it felt like they were the only two people in the world when they were alone. She wanted him to have that world, to remember. He throws the globe and knocks the gun out of Murray's hand. John says that worlds live, worlds die. Nothing lasts forever. Or does it? He remembers his past, the moment when he left the Watchmen universe to enter the multiverse. He arrives in the DC universe on April 18, 1938. He's been drawn to Superman's world for reasons he doesn't understand yet. And the first person he speaks to is Carver Coleman. Carver arrived in Hollywood in 1928 and worked as a mail carrier for a year before he saw the studio head kissing a man behind a stage. He dropped his cigarette, causing the stage to burn down and Carver to lose his job. In 1937, he lost another job as a waiter when he skipped work to wait for an audition that never happened and was evicted a year later. That night, he slept in the streets of Los Angeles. At 10 to midnight, he was awoken by a blue light and asked why is he there. The police have woken him up to move him along out of the nice neighborhood. And John arrives. The first thing he hears is Carver crying out to the man who had struck him. The first thing he sees is Carver checking the man for a pulse. John sees instantly the people in this world are different, and wonders if that's why he was drawn here. Confused for the first time since Adrian used the tachyons on him, he tries to understand the time difference between the two worlds. On Mars in the present, Hal has recovered, and John puts him back to sleep. He does the same to several others, saying he needs them incapacitated for reasons that will become clear. He's waiting for Superman. In 1943, the first Nathaniel Dust picture is released. Though controversial, it is the studio's biggest hit of the year. John introduces himself to Carver in 1938. 
Carver asks if he's an angel, and John says no. He hears Carver's hunger, and they go into a diner. John says he won't need money, and explains that he is shifting the light around his body to appear normal to everyone else. Carver orders some soup. John feels like he's walking through a fog. He tries a simple exercise looking three minutes into the future. He's unable to. He needs something to focus on. He tries one looking one year into Carver's future, and Carver's telling John he was right. He got the part. Back in 1938, Carver thought maybe John was sent to help him, and asks if he isn't an angel, is he God? His eyes are adjusting to this universe. He sees 1943, and Carver is excited about the continuing success of the Dusk series. In 1952, Carver has won an award for his acting. In 1954, Carver is distraught, asking what it means that he won't be here a year from now. In 1955, and John is indeed alone. John can see again. Back in 1938, Carver asked if, if maybe he should just give up? John tells him that eight months from now, he'll be cast in a role that will change his life. On the radio, he hears a report about a man who can lift a car over his head. News about Superman quickly travels across America. John is then gone. Leaving behind a photograph. The green car from the cover of Action Comics number one is smashed into a rock. The people describing a man dressed like a wrestler with a cape who leapt away over a building. Then, the car, the crowd, and Superman are gone. They were never here. The world has changed. Theoretical physics describes the many worlds idea that the universe is constantly splitting into alternate timelines. The heroes of this earth called it the multiverse, and this world was its center. Superman appeared first on April 18, 1938, the first costumed hero. In 1940, Alan Scott survived a train crash by holding onto a green lantern. Around the same time, the origins of the Flash, Jay Garrick, Hawkman, the Atom, Al Pratt, Dr. Fate, Sandman, and the Spectre, and Our Man all occur. In 1940, the Justice Society meets. They would like to wait for Superman to join before they announce themselves. He was an inspiration to Flash, but Adam thinks the Green Lantern in the ring is power enough. Johnny Thunder says he can find Superman and begins to ask his magic genie for help. Suddenly, the scene changes and Green Lantern has never heard of Superman. No one has. In 1948, John arrives to meet Carver Coleman. He asks if he's ever heard of Superman, which he hasn't. John leaves. He goes to the Kent farm, where it always begins. In 1956, Superman is seen in Metropolis for the first time. Twenty-five years earlier, a rocket lands in Kansas. Jonathan and Martha Kent find the orphan boy, and John realizes that an outside force moved Superman's arrival forward in time. This change affects every world in the multiverse. Superman is first seen in 1938, and now it's 1956. Then it changes again, and he's now being shown the rocket by Pa Kent in 1986. It changes again. And again. Clark runs out to the field saying he doesn't want to be different, he wants to be Jonathan's son. Jonathan Kent tells Clark that he is his son. John doesn't understand this universe. Clark says goodbye to his elderly parents in 1949 before they pass away. In 1956, he visits the graves of his parents. In October 1986, his parents are alive. Years later, Jonathan dies again in his son's arms. John believes he's misinterpreted what this universe actually is, and he looks to the future, following Superman's trail of influence. How can one man affect so much, even a thousand years in the future? His hope is alive. After years of isolation and loneliness, Clark is brought to the future by three super-powered teenagers and shown the legion of superheroes, which he inspired with his heroic career. John realizes that this universe is much more than it appears, and it's all connected to him. Why is he the center of this universe? Forces such as the Anti-Monitor and Extant have been responsible for shifts in his timeline by causing the reboot shown in Crisis on Infinite Earths and Zero Hour. Darkness seems to target the Hopi and bodies in efforts to redefine him. John grows curious. As others have done, he reshapes the universe to see how it forms around Superman. He changes the past to challenge the future. And as he watched reality come crashing down, he realizes the universe is not part of the multiverse as he had believed. The multiverse reacts to this universe. There have been endless parallel worlds, none, 52, a dark multiverse, all created by changes to this one. This universe stands apart from the multiverse. It is the metaverse, and it is in a constant state of change. As John removes the linchpin of the Justice Society, he changes Superman once again. 
He watches his take on reality sharpen into focus. Superman is sent to Earth as a child and found by the Kents in the wake of Martha having a miscarriage. On the eve of Clark's high school prom, his parents are killed in a car accident. Without his parents or the Legion, Clark grows more distant from humanity. John understands him better, relates to him more. Five years ago, he feels the power of changing Superman. It is intoxicating. He has altered the metaverse and in turn the multiverse. He has created the new 52 universe is what this seems to be saying. One year ago, the metaverse became aware of his hubris. Wally West escapes the Speed Force long enough to warn John that he knows what he did and that the heroes will stop him. John realizes the metaverse is not passive. Like an organism fighting to survive, he has underestimated and the innate hope that fights back to the surface. He has recreated the metaverse and it has turned against him. He sees a vision of Superman in the future. He has found John. And he destroys him or John destroys the metaverse. John stands in Carver's apartment on June 8, 1954, the day Carver dies. In 10 seconds, Carver will be dead. As he fixes John a drink, Carver Coleman is murdered by his mother. In the Dusk film, he is shot by his cop friend. She and her associate take what valuables they can find. His housekeeper burns her letter, protecting his secret. The murder is never solved. It's May, 1979. I have ended the war in Vietnam. I watch Edward Blake shoot a woman with child and do nothing. It's April 1938. I use a man named Carver Coleman to help me find balance in the metaverse. Sixteen years later, I watch his mother bludgeon him to death in his home, and I do nothing. It's November 1st, 1985. Adrian kills millions to unite the world. November 2nd, I let him walk free. I am a being of inaction on a collision course with a man of action. To this universe of hope, I have become the villain. The title quote for chapter 10 comes from Socrates. Every action has its pleasures and its price. The back pages for issue 10 are the letter Carver's mother sent him splattered with his blood and the script for the adjournment. She threatens to reveal that Carver is a homosexual demanding money or else she will sell her story. On page 1, Dusk drinks to forget his dead ex-wife and lost children when his cop friend Murray comes to his office. On the second to last page, Dusk throws the globe at Murray. He goes for the gun, but Joyce kicks it away back to Murray. Dusk says he, he hasn't lost yet. He's called the police and they're outside. He solved the chess murders 35 minutes ago. He knows they were both targets and Joyce had Murray kill them both. He was so focused on what made the two men different when it was what they had in common that mattered. The city planner was Murray's brother-in-law. Every plan he approved over the last year was connected to Joyce's mobster husband's businesses and he was on the payroll. The banker fronted the cash. He just doesn't know why they brought him into it. To keep him busy while they cleaned up loose ends? Or did Joyce want him to stop her? As the cops rush in, Murray shoots Dusk in the back. The final scene shows Dusk limping on a crutch, wounded from the shooting days before. Dusk says the limp will put me out of the game permanently. I don't mind. I was honest. I was loyal. And I learned the greatest lesson of all. It's not who wins or loses. It's how you played the game. The president has declared that without Superman, the U.S. must rely on traditional deterrence to foreign threats. Batman prevents the launch of a nuclear missile. Gang war has broken out between Joker and two new villains across Gotham. Alfred reads Rorschach's journal and goes out looking for Reggie. Putin prepares to send the people's heroes into America after Superman if he does not appear. The National Guard is out in Gotham to arrest Batman, who has been charged with treason after leaving dozens of American soldiers wounded, some severely. Wonder Woman fights with Titania and Black Adam to defend the United Nations. Black Adam says she preaches a peace as if that's what the United States leaders actually want. He says they are descended from the same people who raped the Amazons, who killed so many of them. They fight for the privileged. He says that he fights for the oppressed, and he asked her whose side is she on. Hundreds of metahumans are gathering in Kandak. If the government would come clean about the few they did create, maybe they could help restore faith in the rest of them, but they will not. The Amazons prepare a rescue mission to bring Diana back to Paradise Island. Putin has given the United States a deadline of midnight to hand over Superman, and many Americans believe they're better off without him. Lois tells Lex to wipe that smile off his face. He says it is a sail and claimed to be from another world, as did the man he fought with. He had claimed he created an alien invader, the illusion of a common enemy which killed millions but united his planet. 
Lois says, if that's true, he's a bigger madman than Lex. Lex says he was exposed, and his world fell in nuclear war, leading him to come here, seeking the only being with the power to save it. He was desperate to find Dr. Manhattan. The doomsday clock is at one minute to midnight. Superman wakes up alone. Metropolis is engulfed in riots, as is every city in the world. The title of Chapter 11 is a lifelong mistake. A metahuman military exercise has destroyed the pyramids of Giza. A bizarre lightning storm is tearing across the United States. Japan suggests the odd weather is due to firestorm detonation, though the source is a debated topic. America's metahumans went to Mars days ago searching for answers and have not been heard from since. The Flash Museum and Planet Krypton theme restaurant have been set on fire by the mobs. Adrian must have returned the owl ship after meeting with John because he has both Johnny Thunder and Saturn Girl locked in cells. Adrian pets Bubastus as he watches the chaos unfold on his many monitors. He hopes there will be a world to remember. This world needs a hero. Adrian hears Saturn Girl in his mind, at first mistaking her for another screen. She wants to know why she can't read his mind. Lex leads Lois into his most secret facility and shows her an item he bought from the estate of Carver Coleman, a photograph of John. He believes it was found on April 18, 1938. He's been tracking strange anomalies like this since he was a boy. Two years ago, he'd been tracking abnormal coronal energy spikes, increasing in power and frequency, leading him to believe something was trying to enter the universe from beyond. In a park, he overheard two flashes talk about someone who has altered reality, back when Barry remembered Wally used to exist but they weren't the source of the anomaly. Lying in the grass was a photograph. He says there was also chronal debris in the area, including the film he sent her, and some personal items of Wally's. Evidence that reality had been altered, but the photograph was a true anomaly. Lex shows Lois dozens of identical photographs arranged in order. His teams have found them all over the globe, mostly in America, but one was found in the Congo only days ago. The first appears to be the one from 1938, but John's suit clearly is from the 50s. Lois asks if the photos are traveling through time, and Lex says not these. They appear to be left behind like a trail of breadcrumbs across most of last century and into this one. She asks why someone would create these, but Lex doesn't think he's aware of it. But whoever they are, they're the most powerful being Lex has ever encountered. As the end approaches, things come into focus. John clearly sees the moment of Reagan's ass attempted assassination. Four hours from now, the street he's on will be rubble, and he will speak with Superman for the first time. Superman is being accosted by American soldiers who ask him to come with them under orders from the president. Superman asks him to lower their weapons. He doesn't want any trouble. Saturn Girl tells Adrian that Superman will stop him. He tells her that Superman doesn't know he exists. She can read his mind but can't find the truth. His head is full of lies. He says she's come here from the future to warn Superman about something she doesn't understand. He tells her one truth though. She's never going to see Superman again. Superman takes off, saying he'll go to the president to discuss the issue with him. Saturn Girl tells Adrian a truth, that he will never destroy Superman. He says with a grin that he's counting on Superman surviving whatever comes his way. Reggie dreams of his father, sees him walking into his cell against the warnings of police, and screams for him to turn back. Flames burst from the cell, engulfing him. Staring into the flames, Reggie sees Mothman walking out to greet him. Reggie says that Rorschach was a monster, Byron tells him to see what he wants to see, and morphs into an ink blot, which morphs into Rorschach's face, and he says that he sees the world dying, and he reaches through Reggie's bars to grasp his neck. Reggie wakes screaming and Alfred is there. He reminds Reggie that he liked his cooking. He apologizes for not believing him and asks for his help in stopping Ozymandias. He brought pancakes, but Reggie insists that he's not Rorschach and runs away. Mime and Marionette deal with a hunting party of Joker's goons. Marionette slices through a thug's gun hand, and Mime is holding something. Adrian's original plan was to find John and convince him to return to this Earth, to save it from nuclear annihilation. But he knew after the discussion that John would never listen to him, so he set his sights on Mime and Marionette. By promising them the location of their son, he pulled their proverbial strings. Mime lets go of his invisible rope, and the comedian drops onto one of the goons. I required them because of their past experience with Dr. Manhattan. John was responsible for their incarceration. Everyone believed he had hesitated to kill Marionette because she was pregnant, but I knew in the past John had watched the comedian shoot and kill a pregnant woman and had done nothing. John revealed to me over the years he had seen Marionette's child's future. This boy would be adopted by a couple and he would bring joy to a woman who had been very important to John at one time in his life. 
I hope that upon seeing Marionette, John would be reminded of the family he chose to protect by granting Marionette a mercy she most certainly did not deserve. And you broke them out of prison? Not me. My other puppet, who was even easier to manipulate than Marionette and mine. Reggie Long mistakenly believed Rorschach was a friend of his father's, Dr. Malcolm Long, because Byron Lewis chose to rip out the pages in Dr. Long's report detailing the dark turn in his relationship with Kovacs. As the new Rorschach, Reggie came after me, blaming me for his parents' death but he found me dying of cancer, a facade I maintained until John exposed the truth. Reggie believed I was overwhelmed with guilt and shame over the tragedy in New York. He gathered Marionette and Mime, and once I re-engineered the owl ship, you turned it into a time sphere. Whatever you want to call it. It locked on John's signal, and as the missiles fell around us, we made our way to this universe. Poor Reggie. He had no idea he was wearing the mask of the man that destroyed his parents working for the man who manipulated him as Byron unknowingly did, coming to this strange, colorful world. And it was here that I realized John had journeyed to someplace special and horrifying. A world of extremes impossible to reconcile, one full of hope and at the same time despair, a schizophrenic society overrun with superpowers and costumes. He refused to help us obsessed with an impending confrontation with Superman that would lead to his own destruction or this universe's, but it was clear why John had ventured here. To be with his own. He refused to help us, believing that a confrontation with Superman would lead to his or this universe's oblivion. So I came up with a new plan, one to save both worlds. This world's belief in Superman was holding it together like string and chewing gum. In order for things to change, they must hit rock bottom. So what if I could turn the world against Superman? In my search, I discovered the Superman theory to be partially true. After Superman's arrival, the U.S. government had begun experiments in an attempt to create its own metahumans. These confidential programs were led by Professor Martin Stein, who later caused the accident that bonded him and student Ronald Raymond into Firestorm. Raymond's psychological profile revealed a deeply flawed and insecure human being, one I could manipulate as Stein did. After I leaked this information to Firestorm's Russian counterpart, Pozar, I placed Raymond under increasing pressure from the media. Ultimately, Superman went to Moscow to intervene, defending Firestorm in the hopes he might save lives. Then Bubastis helped me create a little... detonation. People died, Superman was blamed for protecting Firestorm, but I wanted the metahumans who would no doubt investigate to quickly learn the explosion was not Firestorm. The heroes of this earth would track the energy not back to me and Bubastis but to John, resulting in a battle that removed all of Superman's metahuman allies. The stage is set. The news reports that Russian metahumans are gathering in Red Square ahead of the midnight deadline and Amazonians have stormed the United Nations and kidnapped Wonder Woman, leaving no one to stop Black Adam. On the White House lawn, Black Adam destroys the President's chopper. The lightning storms have covered Black Adam's troop movement. He issues a message to all metahumans that the revolution is now, inviting them to join him and free the world from enslavement. Superman lands and says this has gone far enough. Black Adam gives him one chance to stand aside. Whatever you're trying to do, Superman will stop it. I've seen the future, and it's because of Superman. Yes. Well, if Superman is so important to you, to your existence, then let me ask you one thing, Saturn girl. Does Superman remember you? No. No, what's happening? I would theorize you're no longer part of the timeline. You just didn't realize it. Long live our worlds. This one will become my tomb, but that tomb will be a monument. Oh, quit crying, old man. You're from the past, and the past won't be erased. In six seconds, Superman will see me. Five, four, three, two, one. It is now. It is Superman. It is me. It is us. It is the world. It is time. It's time. The title quote is from James Joyce's A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man. I am not afraid to make a mistake, even a great mistake, a lifelong mistake, and perhaps as long as eternity, too. The back pages for issue 11 are Lex's photographs, the first being the one from 1938. Numbers 2 through 11 show John's path through the DC Universe, from the movie studio to the train wreck to Smallville to Arkham Asylum. 
The final photograph shows the Flash of Two Worlds cover, the first story that established Earth 2 in the multiverse. Flex has realized he and Superman are locked in endless permutations of struggle across different versions of reality, and will stop at nothing to learn more about it. John thinks back across his whole life, realizing that everything ends. Nothing lasts forever. Not hope. Not even him. He remembers his origin, his transformation, his father telling him time no longer matters and abandoning his work as a watchmaker. Dr. Manhattan faces Superman. In 11 minutes and 57 seconds, it all ends. Trying to understand the nature of the metaverse, John reached into history and the world turned against him. Now he faces a collision with its most unavoidable and greatest antibody. John says, hello, Superman. Superman asks who he is, and John says he's the one Superman is going to destroy, or the one who will destroy everything. Superman is distracted by Pozar leading a group of foreign metahumans seeking retribution for the Moscow incident. The title of Chapter 12 is Discouraged of Man. Black Adam invites Pozar to be part of a government that doesn't want to control him, but he refuses to betray his homeland. John thinks over what he knows of the DCU timeline and its changes, and he watches Superman get attacked. As Superman fights, John thinks he is stuck at a question with two answers, and he cannot see beyond Superman. Other countries are mobilizing their metahumans to join the conflict in America. In ten minutes, the world melts away, and John sees nothing but darkness. Reggie is attacked by a shop owner. He tells him to fight back, but Reggie sees nothing to fight for. Alfred arrives and knocks the owner out with his own weapon. He offers the face to Reggie, but Reggie says he doesn't know what it is. Alfred says that he read Kovac's journal. He knows what it is. Reggie slams Alfred into the wall, yelling that Rorschach was a monster, filled with emptiness. Reggie's eyes were closed, but now he sees the truth. Fighting won't help. Alfred's world will end like his did. Alfred says that it will unless they do something to save it. He asks Reggie to see what he sees. Pieces of rock floating in space. He sees no future. He sees no hope. Hope is lost, and he cannot find it. Meta-human war has engulfed Washington, D.C., and if you've read Kingdom Come, you know that this is the kind of war that, left unchecked, can end a world. <sighs> Father used to wake me up every morning with a smile on his face. He'd tell me no matter what came, no way to make the most of it. He believed there was good to be found everywhere. In everyone. We just had to look for it. We had to see it, and help others see it, too. Never gave in to dark thoughts. Some people can't see the good. They only want, want everyone else to suffer with them. And they're going to win. The world is drowning in hate and anger. Sides separated by an ever-widening canyon of digital bile. Soon, both factions will tumble off edge. Falling into bottomless pit of liberal self-righteousness and outdated identity politics. Hands clutching their weaponized phones, finding no olive branch to save them because neither side knows what that means anymore. Why not let this ugly world destroy itself? There's nothing we can do now. Dr. Manhattan watches passively as a car is about to crush a woman and a young girl. Suddenly, Superman catches the car, saving them. He yells at John to help these people, whoever he is. John says he doesn't help him. He's seen it. Superman says that he can't do this alone. Less than four minutes remain in John's sight. He remembers this feeling. Millions died, a complicated prospect of peace brought to an unhinged world. Killing Walter Kovacs, he became part of the lie, not yet realizing the illusion would one day end. Lex tells Lois to go write her article and expose the truth about history being altered. Lois asks why, to panic people? Lex says no, so that he gets the credit for the discovery. He selects a vibrational emitter from his arsenal and heads out into the world. He has a meeting with someone. Mime and Marionette joyride away from the police. The comedians still are captive. Batman has arrived and asks if Reggie believes everything is predetermined as John does. Reggie says that if he read the journal, then he knows who Rorschach is too, and why he can't wear that mask. He says Byron Lewis lied to him, and now all he can see is Rorschach destroying his parents. Batman says Reggie sees a monster when he looks at the mask, but he can take it, change it, make people see something else. He would know. Superman flies toward John, his cape torn, his blood staining his hands.
John closes his eyes to meet his destiny. Superman, eyes filled with rage, throws his fist forward. Superman's fist flies over John's shoulder and strikes Pozar before he can attack John. John is confused. Why would you defend me? I don't know what to think about all this, but I do know that right now, right now you have a choice to make. You talk about me destroying you or you destroying me because all you see beyond this is nothing, but maybe there's a third choice. Who is she? She? You're creating these photographs with every step you take. I assume they're important to you. John! Janie! She was. Maybe the darkness you see? Maybe it takes everything you have to save your world. Maybe you make that choice. Yes. I understand now. Everything ends. Blue light envelops this universe. As reality fades into darkness, Superman is left alone, and then finally his symbol is the last thing in existence. It too dissipates, leaving only darkness. Even the borders separating the panels are gone, and there is nothing but a single black infinitude. It is the end. The doomsday clock is stopped. But it is also the beginning. Time returns to the universe as panels have borders again. A light bursts out from the darkness. The planet Krypton explodes and a single rocket escapes the destruction. It begins with a child. The metaverse forms around this one and only sun. The rocket lands in a multitude of times and places. Jonathan Kent tells his son too dangerous to show himself to the world. He says they've never seen anything like him. If they did, they'd be afraid. In July of 1940, Alan Scott dies in the train wreck. John moves the lantern back, and now Alan Scott survives and becomes Green Lantern. Now Jonathan Kent tells Clark that in his youth, his father told him stories of the Justice Society, heroes who made people feel safer and inspired them to do their part. If Clark's ready to get out there and show people what he can do, Jonathan says the world is ready. Clark goes to the dance and his parents drive home. Again, the car careens toward a tree, but now it is caught in time by Superboy. Adrian and Bubastis have both felt the change. One thousand years from now, the Legion exists again. In 1917, Johnny Thunder is born and sent to Badnesia, the home of his magical genie. Through her ring, Saturn Girl tells Johnny he only forgot that he became the Magic Thunderbolt. He speaks his magic word and transforms. The future and the past are free. Back on the streets, Superman no longer fights alone. Saturn Girl and Jay Garrick both greet him. Jay apologizes for being late. Superman says, well, better late than never. Superman flies at Black Adam, now backed up by both the Legion of Superheroes and the modern Justice Society of America. Johnny Thunder pits his magical thunder against Black Adam's lightning as winds. As the battle ensues, the heroes have the upper hand. I see tomorrow. I see the man of tomorrow. And for the first time, I am inspired. It is April 18th, 1938. Metal whines as Superman lifts a 1937 Ford over his head, revealing himself to Metropolis. Decades later, a police scientist struck by lightning and the birth of the Speed Force rattles the metaverse. Superman's timeline shifts forward and reality divides for the first time, creating the multiverse. Earth 2 is born. After the first and greatest crisis, the Earth divides again. Earth 1 becomes Earth 1985, a world unexplored even today. And now I understand why these Earths exist. Every time there is a change in the metaverse, the multiverse grows to preserve every era of Superman. More are created over the years, including one because of my interference. After the flashpoint and this rebirth, Earth 52 is out there. I look beyond now. In the year 2020, Superman's timeline is bombarded by the reckless energies of the old gods once again warping the metaverse. It's July 2nd, 2025, a crisis unlike any the metaverse has seen, one they will call Time Masters erupts, but in its wake Superman is revitalized, and his greatest allies return. No matter how many times Superman's existence is attacked, he will survive, even if change is a constant, because hope is the North Star of the metaverse. It is January 2026, the timeline is restored, and Earth 5G is born. It is June 17th, 2026. 
Superman goes on a quest to find Bruce Wayne's lost daughter so she can save Bruce's son. On July 10th, 2030, the secret crisis begins, throwing Superman into a brawl across the universe with Thor himself and a green behemoth stronger than even Doomsday who dies protecting Superman from these invaders. In its wake, Superman's timeline shifts forward again. It's April 18th, 2038. Superman appears in public for the first time. 22 years earlier, the Kent's prayers for a child are answered when a rocket lands on their farm. Superman's timeline shifts forward again. April 18th, 2038 now marks a different date. Jonathan, Martha, and their baby, Colin, find a boy who will one day be Superman. The rocket arrives again in the year 2045, delivering the Kents their only child. They find the rocket with their three-year-old daughter, Clara, in the year 2162. In 2965, Superman appears in Metropolis for the first time. The rocket arrives. A child is loved. Superman is made. I now understand Superman's true purpose. He will show them the way. And in a millennium, when his timeline converges with the legions, humankind will finally embrace the ways of Superman. He is the bridge stretching across generations that will lead everyone to peace. Between what I learned from Lex pontificating, which took all the patience in the world, and this, thank you, Bruce. The arrival of Wonder Woman, who fought alongside the Justice Society of America during World War II. Countless lives saved by the Legion of Superheroes. I did it. Again. Did what, exactly? Everything we needed to clear Superman's name was on your ship. Yes, I know. I left it for you to find and give to his wife, no doubt. It's all gone according to plan. Don't worry, Bubastis. It's only John. Let him summon us. I know, that damn blue light, and we were having so much... I know what you've done, Adrian. I would expect nothing less by this point in the game, John. Once I learned about your vision of Superman and Superman himself, it was rather a simple initiative. If I couldn't convince you to use your powers to save our world, I was certain he would. All I had to do was arrange the confrontation. So let's go home. Everyone lives today. Adrian is shot. Said maybe you, Vite. Goddamn asshole. Now for you two clowns. I don't use that language often myself, but it's appropriate. You goddamn asshole. What? What do you do? I'm negating the vibrational frequency that's brought you here. I'm sending you back to wherever you came from. No, Manhattan, you son of a bitch. This can't be how it ends. It is October 11th, 1985. Glass shatters. The comedian hits the sidewalk. Fight. We all get what we want, Reggie. I get to die a hero. John gets purpose. You get revenge. Don't want revenge. Want justice. Gah! Want to stop the bleeding. You live. Pay for your crimes. Rot in prison. You're not Rorschach. No. Rorschach is me. Erica Manson, you and Marcos Myers are not coming with us. What? We were promised we'd get our son back. We want our son, damn it. You have a daughter on the way. As for your son, my plan is that you'll see each other again. He will need an anchor here, as I did. An anchor? I see the light now. I see my final purpose. It is April 18th, 1954. My anchor sits in a diner, nerves trembling. It is one second after my annual conversation with Carver Coleman. I'm not going to be here a year from now? What does that even mean? I'm sorry I didn't explain myself better. John, you're back? It is I who will not be around. I don't understand. I haven't been a very good friend, Carver. But I see... I can see so many futures now. Make a good choice. Don't be afraid of what you feel. It's not who wins or loses, it's how you played the game. The Dusk Marathon has ended, and we learn that instead, instead of being murdered, Carver revealed his secret to the world himself before the adjournment released. He was blacklisted for years and lost his home, but he returned to acting in the mid-60s and went on to win an Academy Award. In 1973, he was instrumental in getting homosexuality removed from the American Psychiatric Association's Diagnostic Manual of Medical Disorders. 
He died in 2005, his partner of over 40 years by his side. His personal slogan has been adopted by activists all over the world. Don't be afraid of what you feel. The JLA returns from Mars, claiming to have neutralized the threat to Superman. The JSA has pledged to investigate the Superman theory and the Department of Metahuman's involvement. Martin Stein has been arrested for his involvement. The department has been exposed. Dialogue has begun between the Justice League of America and the People's Heroes of Russia thanks to Superman. The world is healing from both the metahuman crisis and John's involvement. Things are returning to normal. Batman has placed Rorschach's journal in his trophy case. Mime and Marionette end up with the owl ship. Lex thinks Adrian had the right idea, but it could be improved upon. Clark? Cat got your tongue? No, Lois, I just... There's such a long road ahead. Well, no one said you could blink and make everything perfect. The world's more connected than ever, but it's never been so divided. People are choosing sides instead of extending their hands. But it's not too late. You did it. You reached out to him. You changed him. And he'll change someone now, too, don't you think? Because if you have faith in that, there's hope for all of us. Clark begins to smile. His parents step off the bus and they hug. I affected his world. And now he will affect mine. It is November 22nd, 1992. Vice plan has blown up in the world's face. The ash is still warm under my feet. The tachyons from the owl ship departing are still dissipating. It is 1945. The cogs fly into the air. It is 1959. I fix Janie's watch. It is 1992. I see a light. John heals the blasted earth. It is December 25th, 1992. Reggie Long stands over the cold ground in front of Byron Lewis's gravestone and finds warmth. His breath leaks through the fabric as he mutters under the mask. Thank you. It is March 13th, 1993. Vite's headquarters have become his prison. Every day after school, a young orphan named Cleopatra Pack stands outside, obsessed with the rise and fall of Ozymandias. On her 16th birthday, with a fully grown Bubastis at her side, Miss Pock will call herself Nostalgia. Life doesn't stop, but it needs love. As callous and cruel as Erica Manson and Marcos Mayas can be, the love between them is real. What about Anita, after your mother? Eight months from Anita Mayas will be born. It is 1984. Marionette and Mime are robbing a bank a mile from Rockefeller. Alerted, I go to confront them. I hesitate to kill them because I see their son's future. He will bring great happiness to a woman I care about. Yet the details of how and why are unclear to me. Bring him back! Bring my baby back to me! I blame my blurred vision on my recent experiments involving the dialectical unity principle and give it a little more thought. I now realize that blind spot to the details of this child's future, where'd you put him? I didn't touch him, is me. Stop and smell the roses, Dave. I'm planting a whole garden in honor of Dr. Manhattan. There still isn't any proof that Dr. Manhattan was responsible. Oh, come on. Who else could have made every nuclear weapon on Earth disappear? Well, whatever happened, the March for Peace continues around the clock in nearly every major city, demanding no new nukes are made. The Bulletin of Atomic Scientists have reset the Doomsday Clock, so let's keep it that way, huh? You know, they really ought to come up with a better name. Do you think it was him? How could it not be? Can I pour it? Of course, sweetie. Who could that be? Probably just the paper. I'll get it. Oh, hi. Can I help you? I... I'm sorry to bother you, but a friend of your mom and dad's brought me here. He said they'll know what to do. My mom and dad are making pancakes for lunch. Do you want some? My name's Sally. What's yours? John calls me Clark. Every child comes with the message that God has not yet discouraged the man.